and the now. Let's glide. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. The choice of the a minute you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, Jonathan Kite, back in studio. Always good to see you, my friend. What's up, baby? How you been? Oh, man. Hectic. Uh, I was in Naples, running around, five shows. Had to get up at 4 a.m. on Friday to get out of the house by 4.45 to catch a 6 a.m. flight to Naples, but not to Naples, to the whatever airport that's oh, yeah. two hours away from Naples. Yeah. And by the time I rolled in for a 6 or 6.30 show, I give myself about 45 minutes worth of buffer. But as I say to everyone all the time, they go, oh, man, oh, tra- oh the travel, oh, the travel. Look, you know, okay, first thing. You get up at 4 a.m., you're fucked up. Yeah, yeah. And and you're not fucked up for the next two hours. You're fucked up for the day. Yeah. It, it's like saying, well, you got in that horrible moped accident at noon. It's 3. You should be better now. It's like, no, I'm I'm actually worse. Yeah. And, and then it also makes you think about all these studies that come out. Like It turns out sleep deprivation causes premature aging and cancer and ulcers and stress. And it's like... Of course, because the alarm goes off at 4 a.m., and it, it's like being raped in a prison <laughs> cot for me. Yeah. That's how I feel. I feel like, I, I first off, I'll suck any dick. To, if you give me another an hour and 15 minutes of sleep, willingly. get your dick out. Yeah. Willingly. willingly. Yeah. That's it, your snooze button. Tenderly. <laughs> yeah. Lovingly. Yeah. Oh, dude, you'll be <laughs> yeah, back so for there more. There was a snooze button cock. Yeah. And, and by the way, thank God I couldn't. You can't make those kind of deals with the devil because when that alarm goes off at 4 a.m. and someone said, look, you can sleep in till 11 a.m., but we're going to shave a year off your life. I'd go, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah just, I'll do it. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. And at some point I would have died. A farewell. I would have died yeah. at 23. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you get up and you're fucked up and there is no, you know, you go, I, I go to bed that night, it's 11, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, just whatever. Just the anxiety of getting up at four makes me go to bed an hour and a half later. That's the thing I can't, if I got to get up that early, I don't sleep well the entire night. Right. Because I just know that you I have know, to be up. And you think maybe something happened and if I oversleep, I got two sold out shows in Naples tonight. Yeah. You know, so anyway. Yeah. Get there. And you get there, and then everyone's sort of like, oh, the travel. But no, it's not now the work. Oh, no, to do two, your day begins. That's, my day that's begins the job. When I get to Naples. So uh, their thoughts, and we're talking off the air about this, but um, I have a thing, which is let's not fuck with food that isn't broken that we all agree is great. And in general... We've gotten a lot of troubles in nation with the, this is our take on a club sandwich. A club sandwich is not brioche bunned and cut in half. Right. It is a club sandwich with cellophane on toothpicks, cut into little triangles. There is a club sandwich. You do the best version of that you can, but not your own version of a club sandwich. Because as I say all the time, you, you you look at the menu, you go, oh, club sandwich, that sounds good. Give me a club sandwich. And then they bring out something, and then you go, I ordered a club sandwich. And then they go, oh, this is our club. And it's like, yeah, okay. This is our take. Yeah, this has brie and honey. You're right, right. Constructed. And a pumpernickel right. bagel. And other like, stri- what is happening? And other stripper names. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's sandwich. who brings it to you. <laughs> brie and honey. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it more palatable. Yeah, you eat it off them. It's also so a seafood I, buffet. I, so I got... First, I got jacked in the air. Now, the people that do this to you the most are airlines, first class, and the meals that they that they put up. Like, like I've literally, I, I've been in the past, I've seen it all. I've seen, like, there's an omelet, but it's a leek omelet. Literally leeks that are, uh, you know, like green onions yeah, or something. I, I don't know. What onions, about, look, yeah. nobody on the ground has ever ordered a leek <laughs> omelet. Ever. Who's asking for that? Nobody. 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 This wow. is the craziest. Like, uh, do do a cheese omelet. Do a Denver omelet. 
Do one that has, you know, ham and cheese in it or something. But don't do a leek <laughs> omelet because that's nobody's favorite. Like, your job is to go, look, I've taken a poll. Most people like cheese and they like some kind of sausage or meat or something in their, their thing. But a lot of people like a Spanish omelet. Uh, a lot of people like a Denver omelet. Some people just want a plain cheese or like a three cheese omelet. I pulled leek omelet. The guy punched me when I t- asked him if he liked the <laughs> leek get closer. omelet. There's no human being no. that's ever ordered a leek. So why in this? And then they do well because we're first class and we're Canadian air and like we're doing our you know our you know pizza with goat cheese. You know, just just shit you would never. They always fuck it up, right? So I see the offering for breakfast in first class. What airline is this? This was uh, JetBlue. Okay. JetBlue. JetBlue, by the way, has its own names for everything. Yeah. Like I go, mint do, class. Do I got a first class ticket? Oh, no, you're, you're in mint class. Yeah. Oh, wh- where's, where's mint? Is it next to menthol? <laughs> yeah. Like where, spearmint? Yeah. Spearmint, where, where, yeah. where is mint? Yeah. Oh, no, that's first class. Uh, okay. Just... <laughs> Let's just call it first class. So mint like, condition, uh, right? Yeah. You have the mint, the and then after that's like mosaic or something. Yeah. It's, like, it's just it's just called first class, and then it's business or whatever. So yeah. I'm I'm in mint after the discussion. You have to have the discussion. Then I see bagel and locks, mm. and I I didn't grow up with bagels and locks, but as I became an adult, I liked it better. Oh sure, and. So I'm picturing, okay, I'm going to get some bagels and some cream cheese, and tomato, onion slice, and some locks. I'm going to make this thing up. Maybe capers. Capers. Love it. Yes. They bring the whole thing, except for the bagel's not a bagel. It's a bagel chip. No. no. It's an eighth no. of an inch wide. It's a full circumference bagel chip. Like, <laughs> you know that, that that museum thing, like the human anatomy, yes. where they feel that's what it was for <laughs> yeah, bagels. Slight, if there was a museum like, for you to want to know, well, I want to know what the DNA of a bagel looks like. Right, it was body wars, but bagel wars. Yes, it was a circle yeah. with a hole in it that was, at best, three thirty seconds of an inch thick. I mean, first off, I couldn't, smear the cream cheese on it because the cream cheese was cold and the thing just taco yeah. just snapped right yeah. by my hand. So now I have the cream cheese and the thing about the bagels and the locks that works is the it's the dance. The dance between the locks, which are salty and kind of pungent, whatever, and then the bagel, which is doughy and toasted, you yes. know, and it's a sort of a yin and a yang. You know, it's a delicate dance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it's like saying Oh, you like pepperoni pizza? Yeah. Okay. I need you to eat a bucket of pepperoni, and then I'll give you a thin slice of pizza. It's like, no, no. I like the pizza. I like to get a little of the crust in, a little of the cheese in, and then the pepperoni. Mix it. All right. It's a bagel chip. First off, is anybody want? does anyone want this? Does anyone... Been at, at a good deli and one. Oh, I'm going to do the I'm going to do the uh, locks and, and and but I want a super thin, crispy <laughs> bagel. That's I, by the way, I'm holding it. It's bending and then it snaps. And I'd rather eat one of these. Coaster. Right, a coaster. Yeah, a coaster. Right. <laughs> that's that's exact same size yeah. and thickness of this thing. So now I got a big pile of locks and cream cheese and this this thin wheel, this uh, space saver spare of a bagel. That's what it was. And I'm not saying, okay, all right, we're fucked, fine, whatever. But, but later on, the next morning, I get to the hotel and I'm eating breakfast and I see bagels and locks. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avenge this, this loss this I right. had in the air. Yeah. So, so I get bagels and locks. But I see, I see that uh, they have eggs benedict as well. Mm. So I go, I want, and I never order eggs benedict because I love eggs benedict, but I never order it, so I order the eggs benedict. And and I'm taking a bite out of the eggs benedict, and it's like, mm, it kind of tastes kind of flat. I, but I, I don't order it enough to really know what's going on. So I get the salt out, and I start salting it, trying to get the egg brought back to life with the yolk spilling out and everything. And I, and I take another bite, and it's like, that's, that's not salty. It's missing something. I'm taking the pepper out and the salt, whatever. I have no idea. 
at some point during the ride to the airport, the next day I realized they took Eggs Benedict and they swapped out the Canadian bacon wheel and they put a thin tomato slice, which has no flavor and oh, no. Yeah. So what it is is you got the kind of the 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 uh, the, the egg, the sauce, and the um, English muffin are kind of inert. But then the the Canadian bacon is salty and and uh, has texture to it, and and it, it works in concert. Is this with, a JetBlue restaurant? This is JetBlue <laughs> has a cabin on the ground. Yeah, brought to you by JetBlue at Olive right. Garden. This was at the Ritz Carlton. Whoa! And I kept eating it, going, "Why am I not enjoying this?" Because a thin slice of warm tomato just tastes like pus. There's no flavor to That's it. It's not a you know? substitute it's for, not, for, for him. bacon. For Canadian yeah. bacon, right? And Even but, people in the depression are like, "Not no, the same thing." I didn't. I hadn't ordered it in so many years that I couldn't figure it out. And then eventually, I just did half. I don't. I don't know. And the guy just took it, but it's because they fucking took my Canadian bacon. This is what I'm saying. Like, just stop the madness. Yeah. Just stop. It. Just, it's it's Eggs Benedict. That's what it is. Eggs Benedict requires, you know, four ingredients. Right. Put them all there. <laughs> you want to put a slice of tomato on the side? So be it. Whatever it is, but this is what this is. BLT, no bacon, extra right. tomato. Uh, completely unenjoyable. Once again, burnt. How much space are they trying to save on these JetBlue flights? That they don't have room for the full bagel. I, I think, Too much weight. I think yes, to myself all exactly. the time, first off, one bagel will take care of me and my seat partner. Because yeah. he can have that half and I'll have that. One bagel. Right. They, they can't cost anything. I mean, the flight was 1600 bucks or whatever. They don't weigh anything. And has anyone wanted a chip? No. A bagel chip. And you get a pile of locks, a pile of cream cheese. Like, now... The expensive thing. The, the locks is going into the garbage can, half of them, because I don't just want to eat the locks. I want to put right. it on the bagel. Anyway, I, I <laughs> since, what are we doing, though? That's Some of the point. airlines, though, the food has gotten significantly better. Mm. Like, I was just, I flew an American flight, I think, and I couldn't believe how good. I went to Cuba over uh, New Year's. Really? And I had to fly to Miami. And the, the food in first class was one of the best meals I've ever had on a really? plane. I swear. Shout out American, the country and the airline. <laughs> I know Anthony Bourdain has thoughts about uh, Eggs Benedict. I would say, welcome to food you never order anytime, any place. Unless you're at home making the hollandaise sauce fresh on a Sunday morning made with the dew of Mount Olympus and the tears of an angel I never recommend getting hollandaise sauce. It goes incredibly bad immediately, and it's like you're eating a garbage pail kid. Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. That, that was a review I just read. That's from uh, Kitchen Confidential. He also said, don't order fish on Monday. That's right. Mm. Don't order fish on Monday unless you're going to a brothel. So uh, it's raining outside. Pouring. And how do I know? Because my car alerts me every 30 seconds that there's a flash flood warning somewhere. Oh, you mean your phone, right? No, my car. Oh. My car, if you have a car that is a new car, it's tapped into the system. Yeah. Now, Dawson driving his 97 Toyota Forerunner. Forerunner nice. It's not. Still doesn't know. It's not going to be, be made aware of <laughs> Dawson this, came right? here in a Hawaiian shirt and because he's like, my car never told me. <laughs> right. This thing has the thing. Every the light, the whole dash yeah. goes up and it's a flash flood warning. But it, it always says this thing like for Kern and Riverside counties, you know, and it's like, I'm not, I'm not, go, yeah, I'm not there. I, cool. I don't work there. I'm not going there. If you're going to be smart, be smarter or yeah. be dumb. Yeah. You know, if you know where this car is going, you know it ain't Kern or Riverside County. The car in my neighborhood, I had to wake up this morning. I had an audition with the casting, and so they had a Zoom. And so I wake up, and it's pouring, right? A car alarm is going off across the street, like constantly. And then every, like, 20 minutes, the owner will be like, oh, that's me, right. and then go click it off. But for three hours... And the entire time during the audition, the car alarm is going off. On your Zoom audition. <laughs> On my Zoom audition. It, it looks like my character inadvertently 
is is just not paying attention to a break in. <laughs> right. That's what it sounds like. I was right. like, how sensitive does that car have to be that it's just going off from the rain? Right. It's a white person smoke detector. Well, it, it, it's yeah. brought to you by Gen Z. <laughs> yes. I was just like, this is, but the person who is not aware, because I can see the car. We all know it's going off. And and everybody in my building is sort of like, do you guys hear that? I'm like, yeah, we all hear it. It was going off when I, I think I woke up at like eight, whatever. It was going off then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, it was going off when I left to come here. I, people don't even pay attention to car alarms. No, that's no, what I'm saying. I, who, who's, nobody thinks I don't hear that they're a car getting robbed. Go, I must stop a thief. Dude. I go, I got to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm on a phone call right now that I don't want to Nobody be bothered by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I have. You're right. Nobody pays attention to them. So They're what just are annoying. they, what They're are just they doing? And the people that are doing the smash and grab and pulling the backpack and Chris's guitar <laughs> out of the back <laughs> of the sound. rental car, they don't seem to give a shit no, about we, we, any form of sirens or cameras or alert systems, right. cops themselves. No. Like we become completely immune like you used to here's something here's a vestige from the past back when you wanted to commit a crime one guy you had different jobs right you had a wheel man getaway guy you had a yeah. second story man sure some say the best second story guy in the in business the biz, yeah. Yeah. The the biz. Some, yeah. yeah yeah you'd have the safe together. cracker you'd have a demo an explosives guy asian guy in a box asian <laughs> guy in a box yeah who also could do the computer yeah. hacking as yeah. well also. That's, that's and amazing. you had a lookout totally. you had to have a lookout you couldn't commit crime without a lookout yeah you couldn't carjack you couldn't do break into cars you couldn't break into convenience stores like smack you couldn't do all the shit we're doing one guy was a designated lookout that yeah. guy have to look out for Those, nosy neighbors or yeah. cops or all that we've eliminated the the use of the lookout they're all out of jobs they right don't now. give a fuck yeah. in this economy yeah they, well that's the thing we, we used to be a team Right, and now we're divided as a nation more than ever, and I think it's that shows up nowhere more aggressively than in our robberies. Because yeah. you just see people on foot, like you see all the rim cam, uh, the like the, Ring the next doorbell. door. Yeah, it's just one guy. Mm -hmm. Where's yeah. your buddies? No, Where's your lookout? Come on, dude. They're Where's really your wheel code. man? Come on. There's yeah. no wheels. There's, there's running. no second story. <laughs> there's nothing. There's no knife thrower. No. <laughs> we used to have jobs. Where's for your these Ocean's guys? Eleven? Yeah, they put them all together. It took a team. It took yeah. a village, and now it's just smash and grab. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing we always assume. By the time someone's alarm's going off, nobody thinks that that person is getting robbed. No, They just no. think, like, did somebody just hit a car? Someone's oh, no, on gonna get, no, no one's going to get involved. No. Yeah. I always care. used to think about, they always, and they only they had international jewel thieves. Right, sure. But you never heard about the regional guys, you know, the guys the who work the Eagle guys. Rock, Glendale yeah. area, but yeah. didn't really get out of that area. Local they Thomas Crown Affair. The yeah. They had to start somewhere. Jewelry store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, they must have started locally right. and then got regional. See a guy drop down like Tom Cruise, but you realize he's in a CVS? Yeah. He's get, just, just pulling out. Just shit. getting reps. Yeah. Getting 10, just just hours practicing, in. bro. Guys, we got to do a dry run. We're not going to take anything. Let's just break into CBS to see if we can do it. I had a, uh, I got some uh, weird, I don't know why I do it. Every time I look somebody up on the internet, yeah. I always just go, God damn, or holy shit, or it's something. Like, you know, all you have to do is watch an episode of The Love Boat and then IMDB some of these people. You know, the guy who played the boyfriend yeah. of the girl, the girl whose dad didn't like him or something. It'll be some crazy story, right? So... When I was in uh, Naples and we're driving to the to the club on uh, Friday, um, a Cat Stevens song comes on the mm -hmm. radio, and uh, it's XM series whatever, and it's got you know it's got the picture of the album and it says Cat Stevens, you know, and I was thought, oh, I I had this joke uh, that I would never do, I never do on stage, but I've thought about it for years and years and years, and. Uh, and uh, and I, I think I'll I think I'll try it out tonight because I've never I've said it on the radio and stuff, but I've never said it on stage. And basically, the joke was, Cat Stevens, who's now Yusef Islam, mm -hmm. uh, he had such a cool name, you know, and he traded it in for a shit name. <laughs> he had a cool name, like yeah. he had Cat Stevens had the best name out there, and he fucking gave it away to convert to Islam and to embrace Islam. And now he has a shit name. And then I said, you know, um, 
Muhammad Ali was Cassius Clay. I mean, these are good, strong-ass names. Great names. And you gave it away to convert to Islam. And so the joke is me going, started thinking about some guys who should have converted to Islam. Like, you got a bad name. You got to move moving on. And uh, NASCAR great Dick Trickle. He should have embraced Islam. Mm-hmm. And then the sort of comedy ensues where you're picturing a guy in the 80s on the NASCAR circuit, at, like Talladega. <laughs> White as hell. <laughs> White as hell, who's embraced Islam and yeah. how, the, the, how the NASCAR fans would welcome him with open arms. For sure. Sponsorships would come pouring in. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I, started, I was doing the joke in, in Naples. Yeah. And it was working. But I realized I hadn't really... It was Dick Trickle, like, how many races did he win? When was his era? You know, I I knew the name. And if you know the name in, like, golf or NASCAR, that means the person was popular because you just don't know. You don't follow the sport. but Yeah, everyone knows five NASCAR names or, like, five golf names. And if I know Dick Trickle (laughs) from the 80s is a a guy, uh, then he won won some races. But I was – Marina was like, is he still alive? How many – when was his era? Popular, 80s, into the 90s, and but under his, under Dick Trickle's, like, you know, IMDb or whatever it was, it said death. Mm. So I was like, oh, okay, let me, he die in a car accident, or is it, like, what, what happened? And then I read this about Dick Trickle after doing this stupid joke for five shows. Trickle died May 16th, 2013, from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. The All right, incident- hold on. First off. Nobody kills themselves when they're 71 years old. I mean, it's really, that window is like 16 to 23, and your girlfriend has to have dumped you. Yeah. By the time you get to your 70s. What was he, going on in his life? Well, then it, then it became eerie. So go ahead, Johnson. The incident occurred at 12.02 p.m. at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Boger City, North Carolina. So not this Forest Lawn, but there. Yeah. But who all who kills themselves at noon at a cemetery? It just made it easy for everybody. I know. The Lincoln County Communications Center received a call, apparently from Trickle, saying that, quote, there's going to be a dead body, suicide. When the 911 reporter asked who was about to commit suicide, Trickle responded, I'm the one. Police attempted to call his phone back, but there was no response. Trick was found dead beside his pickup truck. His granddaughter, who died in a 2001 car accident, is buried in the same cemetery. Hmm. I was like, God. <laughs> First off, everything's so sad. Yeah, wow. I'm just silly. doing this dick trickle joke. You know, I'm like, you know, when you're doing a dick trickle joke or in any joke, you go, is that guy alive? Is he going to hear this? But also, there's no way that a guy whose name is Dick Trickle ends in suicide. Uh, no, I know. I know. I mean, once you've made it in your 70s, by the way. He truly does have a headstone. Good night, everyone. <laughs> God bless. First off, don't commit suicide. But if you do, this is the way to do it. Don't do the thing where I got to stumble over your body at a truck stop or something using the bathroom. You know, with your brain's all over the place. Go to the cemetery. Yeah. Alert. The authorities, you know, make yeah. it as easy for the living as possible. That's what it says on his on his uh, tombstone. It says he was a courteous man. <laughs> Thoughtful. Yeah. Killing yourself at a cemetery is the definition of courteous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Helpful. Yes. But, but I wonder that's so... I had never heard of him until this moment. Dick Trickle. He's, uh, I don't know, Dawson probably did you know some if, more. Did you know of him only because of his name, though? Or his That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I wonder if a name like that. It, it, it was probably a punchline, yeah. But, I mean, we know Dick Butkus, you know what I mean? And I remember when I was seven, some guy goes, there's a guy named Dick Butkus. And he never underlined the cuss. He'd say kiss, which is, his name is <laughs> Dick Butkut. You know, yeah. I think it's K-U-S or something. Or, whatever it is, it's not kiss, but we turned into Dick Butkus. Kids. He's also one of the toughest. But he's of, also a Hall of Famer. Yeah, t- and tough. I did a commercial with him uh, oh, years back. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did a direct TV commercial with um, Barry Sanders, uh, Peyton Manning, and uh, him. And it was you a. You played the jock? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I played the coach. No, no, no. Uh, I, we were dancers in a, uh, in a direct TV commercial. Like a, no, no, it was like a neighborhood, right? You, you had to look like a normal guy, uh-huh. and who was just like dancing around with a rake. And it was cool because I got to spend the day with them. They were awesome guys. So, yeah, I think the name 
was more the hook with uh, yeah. Dick Trickle, but he 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 ran many many events in NASCAR and had Miller. You know, Miller Beer was his sponsor. You know, yeah, like, with a name like that, he was he was in the thick of things for uh, for quite some time. Was, yeah, Viagra could have been a sponsor. I mean, well, back may, then it would all no, be, yeah, beer. But uh, anyway, killed himself in a cemetery. Where his granddaughter was Coors a sponsor? Was because uh, that would have oh, been rough with the silver bullet. No, mm. I never thought about mm. that. Yeah. That would have mm. been rough. What would that have sounded like if Coors? That guy, who are we thinking of? Sam uh, <laughs> Here's the thing. Let me just say this, partner. Sometimes you'll be out on the range and you'll be thirsty for a cold one, or you'll be thirsty for death. Mm. Either way, Coors Light. Pull it a bull in your head or a bull in your throat. Satisfies. You don't do... I asked you if you did John Wayne, right? I don't. I didn't really do. Nobody does John Wayne anymore. No, because everyone does John Wayne. That's sort of what it became. It's like I had to do a voice thing, like for last week, for or a couple weeks ago, for Jack Nicholson, and it's like I don't even do just because at some point that was like the definition of a hacky. And mm-hmm. by the way, God bless those people that made a living off that. But it's like mm-hmm. if you were just doing those guys forever in the eighties, I right. feel like a lot. Like my sort of thing was like, who could I do that was new? That right. people hadn't really done before. I don't think there's a demand for a John Wayne impression these days. I have demand for a John Wayne. <laughs> Except for here. I'll work yeah. on it for next time. Please. Uh, speaking yeah, of that, yeah. you pull into Vegas, and it's like, ah, oh, Rich Little's going to be playing at the, the Laugh Factory. You know, I, it's like, Rich Residency Little? There. Yeah. I When I was seven, I would watch Rich Little on TV. I know, it's crazy. He's still, still doing it. Doing gigs. Brother. Insane. Dude, you should see his George Washington. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> Just takes out his wooden teeth. Um, no, we're, he's fun. Uh, but that's the thing. It's like those guys. And, and a lot of times, I think when you got so good at something, like a lot of people were doing his John Wayne mm-hmm. or like his Johnny Carson. That's mm-hmm. how good that right. people got at something where you know you're like, oh, that guy, you know, wow, that's, that's pretty damn good. That you're not even really doing John Wayne. You're doing him. All right. Let's talk NFL rules committee. Okay. I feel my contributions could be impactful for okay. the game. And, you know, I got the goalpost uprights raised. Okay. I'm, if one I'm, more game to get this right. I'm this credited <laughs> for this. Um, all right. You, you did feel Everyone feel free to disagree, but here are the new rules. All right? Okay. One, when you pick a ball off, when the defense picks a ball off, or the offense makes a crazy catch like in that San Francisco Detroit game where the thing hits the guy's face mask and then bounces up and the receiver whatever and then the guy cartwheels into the end zone it's the most spectacular play you've seen all week yeah. and all year but it's not a touchdown because on the way down the defender's arm brushed the other guy's groin or inner thigh or hit made some contact some guy con- and they go back and they look at it all the time like the DB picks the ball off takes it to the house and they go back and look and they're like oh on the way down the back of his head touched the other guy's heel and it's like you have to touch the guy down there has you to be some intention with yeah, yeah, intention yeah, yeah. Touch him down. Obviously, your bodies are touching because you're both going up right. after the same fucking ball. Then I pull the ball away in a spectacular play, and then your back hits my chest, and then we go down. Right. And now I get up and go into the end zone, which would have been, oh, my God, greatest touchdown ever, except for it's not the greatest touchdown ever because my fucking elbow made incidental contact with your shin on the way down. Right. You have to make a football move. Right. Yeah. That's what they say. Football, move, football, football move. move. Football move. Football move. Well, you falling down, that's an elderly person's move. That's right. not a football move. So football move is touch him down. Okay. Easy. Yeah. Right? I agree with you. Yeah. And let's big plays stand. You know what I mean? Like that would have been the craziest touchdown ever, yeah. except where they then got the ball on the four-yard line. Nothing... Nothing more of a buzzkill than having to wait for them to review this awesome play that you just watched happen in real time. Yeah, you're super pumped on it, and you're just, and then they just overturn it after five minutes. Right. All like, right. Crazy. That. Okay. We all agree on that. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, who would disagree? 
It's a two-way street. Yeah, One yeah, day yeah. you're you trying team. to grow the game. Yes, here? touch him. You have to make a move. Right, and Give then it makes moments. the guy on the ground. Then you give that guy credit too, because you go, oh, he he had presence of mind to reach, yeah, re- to reach do out something. And grab yeah, the guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's that one. Right. Yes, the next one, the catch. Oh, but the ball was moving when he was going out of bounds. You know, he caught it. It was you know, spectacular. The tight end skied up. Just a got little the loose ball, in the grip. <laughs> sp- pinned it to his head. But the ball was moving a little. Yeah, okay. But then he went out of bounds, and then he turned around holding the ball and gave it to the ref. The ball never touched the ground. Is moving around? Why is that a thing? Oh, did he? It, did they, yeah, or did he have complete control over right. it? Is what they said. That's what yeah. they're saying. Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ! It's a game. Just of, make it a catch. Yeah. If the ball, the ball doesn't hit the ground, it and can he be had moving. One foot in, right? He had one foot in at least. They right? always have what? They have two. They get both feet in, but they go. Feet. The ball was moving a little, and it's like, of course, the ball was moving. The ball was thrown eight feet over his head, and the guy went up with one hand and he was trying to pull it back. He it. Still came yeah. down with it. So, it, is, am I wrong? Is it two feet in college, one feet in pro? It's one in pro. Oh, sorry, one, in, one college. in college, two in two pro. in pro. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's. That that's rough. All right, so we could stop and we could stop examining it over and over. Look, it was moving, but he had his hand on. It. It's like he got the ball. The ball was thrown. It stopped, and he has it, and he handed it back to the ref. Came down with it, right? I, if somebody said like, "Oh, hey, throw me my keys," and they threw your keys, and you went, "Whoa, whoa!" whoa and you got and you <laughs> you know, that's a drop. That's a drop. It's right. like, no, it has to hit right. the floor. Right. Baseball does it. Yes. Totally. All right. Totally. All right. So just fucking make a catch a catch. I don't care if the ball's moving. The ball's going to be moving. The guy's running 20 miles an hour. Okay. Uh, next. Um, I was just watching a replay of the Kansas City Super Bowl from like last year, and the guy does catches the ball, flaring out of the backfield, catches the ball, gets blown up by the DB, ball goes in the air. It's like, he caught it, but no more butts. He caught it. <laughs> He just caught it. He caught the ball. Then he got blown up. Mm-hmm. You're nullifying a great defensive play. The guy oh. catches the ball. He's going to tuck the ball. He takes one step, two steps. Two steps. Come gets on. blown up because the DB puts his hat right on the ball. The ball is saying, changes the complexion of the game. We're going to bring it back. No, nah, no. Nah. The offense still has the ball. Not a fumble. It's like he caught it. We saw him catch it. Now we're now done. He caught the ball. <laughs> they didn't say that he made enough of a football move. Yeah, they do. They, they do <laughs> like it did. First off, being born black with those quads is your football move. <laughs> That's number one. The jet engines, bro. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. You just you got named Detonio. That's a football move. Yeah. You see? DeBrickashaw, any with a D apostrophe, yeah, you've already made bro. your football move before we got you home from the hospital. But the football move is catching the football. Right. Which you clearly did, and then you tried to. And so what's the DB? Why is it on him? He should have waited like a one Mississippi and then blew you up. He, you made a football move by catching the football. He made a better football move by blowing your ass up. Right. But, yeah. Now it's not a, it's not a fumble. It, right. It's weird. It's it's like it, it's it's easy to define, and the problem with the football move is that like he caught the ball, he got one foot down, he got the other foot down, but he didn't start to move. It's like no, he just caught the football. Oh, we'll so they said that. that he didn't give him enough space. I know, Byron. You can find Super Bowl last year's Super Bowl, but they just ruled it as an incomplete. Yes, Kansas City's Kansas City guy got. Got blown up back, I think, sort of drifting out of the backfield. And uh, and it's like, yep, KC ball or, or whatever it was. I can't remember if it was the other team or their team, whatever. But he caught the ball and got blown up. Let's, let's just stop it. I, we get in this argument. Everybody's like, he got it. He did kind of a football move, but it's not really enough of a football. He caught a football. There's a football, and he caught it. So he was That's on the ground when he got move. hit? Hmm? He was on the ground when he got he hit? He got his feet down. That's, yeah. He didn't go up. He just got like hit in the chest and caught it. Yeah. He just got it, it was like bang, bang, you know, catch. Boom, yeah. Blown yeah. up. Maybe if that was in the end zone, would that be a touchdown? Ah, that's a good that's a that's a that's a good question. Oh, it's the Eagles, right? Yeah. Kelsey. Did. 
All right. Now, when they show it the other direction and the guy takes it to the house. And then he doesn't get that. He catches the ball and turns to go to go upfield. Catch, turn, ball oh, out. Oh, that is a bad call. I just, just he caught a football and he started and he to go move. upfield. Yeah. That and was he got, not good. This is a fumble. Catch, turn. He has it for pick a second. Six yeah. For the team that's down. By the way, not that I'm rooting for KC. I'm rooting for justice. Yeah. <laughs> catch. Both feet down, yeah. turn. Yeah. And he was but, moving. Right. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. Right. So what is that? It's an incomplete. Why? What is why? 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 Wh- That's the wrong call. But why are we? Why are we entering shades of gray into an area that don't need shades of gray? Like he made a football move, but not enough of a football. Nope, he caught a football. It's fixed, Adam. Uh, he the NFL's caught a fixed. fucking football. Yeah, that was it. All right, and la- so we all agreement so far. Yes, I lost fifty grand on that. Yeah, go ahead. All <laughs> that play. The last one. Somebody just tweeted me this uh, this morning. I think it was. Uh, Somebody in the Lions game, and I can't remember a Texan. No, not a Texan. Who caught this ball? Oh, a Buccaneer, I think. I think he, he chucked the ball into the stands, this which is, I've been saying. Yeah, you, this is a cell phone you, footage you, from the. You, you stand. can't. A lot of these guys score the touchdown, <laughs> yeah, and then they scream as loud as they can. The new celebration, you just go, Aah! and then you throw the ball as hard as you can at the wall. Yeah. But there's a sideline reporter standing there and like a sound guy holding the dish and a ball boy and a cheerleader. And half of them aren't facing your direction. They're looking up into the stands. There's a -a make-a-wish kid. And you're a guy. (laughs) Look, all yeah, all these guys, the wide outs, the the flankers, the the skill position guys, always the best player on their high school team, right? They by the time they get to the pros. They're playing slot back they got or wide position, out. Yeah. In high school, they all played quarterback mm-hmm. because they're the greatest athletes on the team, and they just run the ball right, right. out of the shotgun. And they, they can throw. Sure. It's just at a certain point when it gets to an elite level, they don't get to play quarterback. But these guys all have guns for arms. Sure. And when they score and the guy chucks it as oh, hard yeah. as he can at the fucking wall, he's going to kill somebody. Yeah. Just go. Look, there's no celebrate. You're not allowed to take your helmet off. You're not allowed to go go down on the ground or whatever. Watch this guy. Catches the ball. Gets up. Chucks it into oh, the stands. Geez. Rifled it. Rifled into the stands and whacks a Lions fan right in the face. Oh, he's wearing glasses, He's wearing too. glasses. And he colored his beard blue. So he uh, deserved it. Well, his wife definitely <laughs> thought it was funny because he's like, Herb, you look like an idiot. Boy, I'm going to the Lions game, yeah. bitch. I uh, hope you get hit by an Aaron Paul. Your blue may be beard, but your face is red right, right now, buddy. The I'm, guy fires a bullet. By the way, uh, has anyone seen the Brady Bunch? A football caused some damage. Oh, yeah. It can break a vase. It can break Marsha's nose. Yeah. Like, if some guy with an arm... A, I've caught a, a cannon, ball. bro. I've caught cannon. Dan Marino's pass before. This it, came out nowhere. By that the way, that's not even up. that far. I, I I know he just. I'm saying he. It's a line drive. Like he's trying to win a prize at a carnival. Right. right. And hit the blue beard, win a goldfish. It's all blue in the stands. So you as the Bucks receiver, like fuck you, blue. And he wins it, and the guy gets whacked in the face. Now you got to make a rule that you can't chuck the ball. Well, here's. Can I, with, yes. Real quick, you know what that should have been? Mm. A glasses commercial. Mm. Those That shit did not break. I know. Yeah. Are you kidding me, bro? I want that brand. Look yeah. at that. That is a Lens Crafters mm. ad if I have ever seen one. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, what happens, sir? Oh, he, he should get to keep that ball, right? I mean, he should be able to oh, sue. Dude, that should, <laughs> you should be able to sue the multimillionaire athlete who fucking threw a ball at your yeah, face from it point went, blank right? Yeah, why do that? Like, wh- what is that... Because the new way of celebrating is to be pissed off, sure. not to the, the old school, cool in the right. gang version of celebrating. That's gone. NBA does it too. Everyone's got to scream and then act out in anger somehow, but didn't which they is to not whip a good the ball sign. at the ground. Hmm? Didn't they used to whip the ball? Oh, right. like, yeah. 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 No, no, that's Can't not enough that. anymore. No, remember, I was a coach for that commercial. We used to say whip the ball. <laughs> yeah, Let right. me be very clear. Guys, whip those balls. Yeah, Are we Manning, doing this? He's cool that I am. All right. So he throws the ball. Anyway, the, the rules commission is going to have to say, along with taking your helmet off, 
or dropping down to the ground or whatever else or doing the dagger. Oh yeah, yeah. It, the <laughs> neck, the neck cut, the neck slit, the throat slit off. Unless yeah. you're a Can't buccaneer, you're too you, aggressive. You should be able to do it if you're a buccaneer because the guy's That'd got a honest. knife That's, in his yeah. mouth on the skin thing. They Come should on. all have some of their own. Here's guys. what I would say if I was in the rules committee. Yeah. Okay. I'd go, look, uh, we're going to make it illegal for them to chuck the ball at the wall or in the stands or anything as a celebration. Then some asshole's going to push back. Right. You know, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to go, Tim, weren't you the guy? who outlawed the throat slit move four years ago. Wasn't that your idea? Like, yeah, no. So we can simulate cutting a head off, but we can't actually, if we try to take right. someone's head off right. with a fucking football, right. that's no problem at all. So you'll let, he'll, he'll let you mime it. <laughs> yeah, you can like, do this. They outlawed the simulation, but not the actual throwing the ball at someone's head. Yeah. yeah. All right. Here's what you do. Hmm. One, you just get a basketball hoop behind Behind the goalpost. Mm -hmm. Then they could dunk it there because you can't dunk on the goalpost either because right. you might bend it, right? Oh, right. right. Which mm. I miss I miss doing. But yeah, you shouldn't be allowed to throw it. And also, you should not be allowed to taunt if you're down by more than 14 points. I if, agree. If you block them in the end zone from scoring, you should be able to mime a hanger giving an abortion on yourself. Yeah. That's going to take some... You know, choreography. Some creative mind. Bringing someone from But listen, Broadway. we got it. It's a safer way to do it. Yes. Than, it, than to hit somebody in the crowd. Just, All right. If yeah. the NFL's listening, which you they are. Your, your marching orders. Which they are. All right. Let's take a break. We got some news we want to get into. Yeah, I'll give you some uh, Grammys rundown because I know oh, you missed Grammys. it. Oh, Grammys. Oh, Grammys. All right. Grammys, maybe some news. We'll do yeah. all that right after this. And now, a couple of impressions from Jonathan Kite. Hoo 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 it's Al Pacino, the scent of a woman. Excuse me, ma'am. Would it be all right if I grabbed your hoo That's Al Pacino in Consent of a Woman. <laughs> Jonathan Kite is on the Adam Carolla Show. Jonathan Kite just ran to the little boy's room. He'll be back in a second. I'll tell you, he's got live dates coming up all over the place. Zanies in Illinois and Cap City Comedy Club in Austin. Hyenas in Fort Worth. And what you can do is you can go to jonathankitecomedy.com and you can find out all of Jonathan's uh, live dates all over the country. All right, Max, we got some Grammys. Yeah, so Grammys were last night as uh, we record this, hosted by Trevor Noah. Do not like Trevor Noah? Why not? I've Because Trevor Noah does my least favorite thing, other than he does the, th the thing that I hate most, <laughs> which is him and, you know, like, Ilhan Omar and stuff, they do this, which is like, they come to this country. They like flee to this country because mm -hmm. their country is a piece of shit. And then they bash this country all the time because they're progressive. They have to bash it. But it's like, you came from a place that was much worse. And now you come here and you're shitty about it. And you have this great reverence for your old country. And I hate any of those people. I think they're destructive. Well, he hosted again. Oh, um, good. Yeah. So he, I, he uh, first Dua Lipa opens the show with this uh, this fun song and dance number, and then uh, comes Trevor Noah's monologue. Uh, I thought he was all. I thought he was always okay doing the Grammys. Like there wasn't anything. I was thinking he's okay comedically, yeah. but just okay. I've just never, okay. I never thought he was that funny. The, uh, this year, I thought he was a little. He seemed to have this weird nervous energy. Like you, he, hmm. he, he kind of did the Anthony Anderson thing where he's just trying to prop everybody up. Didn't roast anybody, mm -hmm. just being stoked for everybody who's walking in. Mm -hmm. um, now remember, remember last year as he was doing jokes. Uh, what they did is they have the tables now instead of like the just all theater seating. It's oh, at, it was okay. at Crypto.com Arena. Mm -hmm. So the tables and he's going around, but like people were running late last time. Mm -hmm. uh, people ran late this time too. So he was mm -hmm. going to empty chairs like, oh, Meryl Streep was gonna, is going to be here. She's here. Or Taylor Swift's going to be here. Or uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, they're going to be here. And then he proceeds to do with a joke because they're not sitting at the table when uh -huh. he practiced it. Uh -huh. So, um, But here's uh, him talking about Meryl Streep in front of an empty chair as Meryl, Meryl's going to come in. But mm. you can you just hear his like... 
what I thought was kind of a nervous energy. She's going to be in this chair. I can't believe that Meryl Streep is here. I really can't believe it. Because, I mean, you, oh, that, what? What? You thought I was lying. You thought I was lying. You don't have to apologize to me. Meryl Streep, yes. Yeah, and this moment right here, you know what that means? It means the Grammys is going to win an Oscar. Yeah, I don't know how, but we just did it. I want to thank both academies. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This yeah, but he, but he was, you know, he's he's uh, going to each of the tables. Uh, Taylor Swift walked in when he was doing a twi Taylor Swift joke, mm -hmm. um, and he did a joke about the NFL cameras cutting away. He did. Yeah. Wow. So here's his, uh, you want to see his version yeah. of it? Yeah. Yeah. So here's his version of that. I think it is so unfair how NFL fans have been complaining about the cameras cutting to Taylor Swift, right? Like she's controlling the cameras at the games, right? Like, like just let her live, let her live. In fact, tonight on Taylor's behalf, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give her a break. Every time, every time they mention Taylor Swift, I'm gonna get revenge. Every time someone says Taylor Swift, I'm gonna cut the cameras to someone who played football. That's what I'll do, cut, bam, just like that. Terry oh yeah, Cruz. you like that, Terry Crews? You like that, Terry Crews? You better fix your face, Terry. Taylor loves it. That's mm -hmm. funny. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a good joke. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. You know, the thing is, I would say, like, I miss Ricky Gervais always, you know? Yeah. Just because I think that we, as a society, take ourselves... I mean, listen, we're in the business of comedy, amongst other things, but it's like, we they there's such a seriousness there. Where mm -hmm. it's like, you, 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 you dress up in like these gowns of people on the Titanic. Right. And you're, you're in these big artistic pieces and, and it's awesome. I love the fashion, but then it's like, you're clearly like, you're making a statement, you're having fun, you're out there. But then the moment it comes to like talking about you, it's like, you can't say anything. Mm. And then people just sort of freeze. Right. And they go, no, we're not allowed to be commented on. And so it, it's like this new thing of comedy where it's like lighthearted and they're not really saying anything. And that's what's substituting comedy right now. That's and, a, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like an energy. They're just putting right this, this exactly. It's an out. upbeat energy. And then when Ricky Gervais, who by the way, people still love that dude. He's still funny. That it's like you're like oh to be roasted by him. And it's like yeah because you you you're all such a in a good way. Like when you, the Academy Awards, everybody's privileged to be in that room. Mm -hmm. Nobody's doing badly. No. You're all doing great. Right. You're getting honored to be playing someone else. Right. And we're just having fun. And so now, we, but but we need to stay away from commenting on it in any capacity, or it seems negative. It's yeah, like, what's going on here? Yeah, I I think the problem with um, Ricky Gervais is everyone wants to be Ricky Gervais the fifth time he does it, but not the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah but he took that bullet. I rewatched. No, he all. did. Yeah, that's what him. I'm saying. And I'm, and, you know, if the kids are listening, you know, it's always my Snoop Dogg smoking pot theorem, which is Snoop Dogg gets to smoke pot wherever he wants to smoke pot. Mm -hmm. If you go to the green room of Kimmel's show and light up a doobie, you will be arrested. But Snoop Dogg Snoop turns everything into a green room. But, but who lights the first doobie? You know what I mean? You have to become that person. And Absolutely. the way you have to do it is you have to just suck it up and go for it the first time. But, yeah. the, but nobody... Everyone kind of makes business decisions the first time. Totally. You know? Everything is a bandwagon decision now. Right. So now you're you're basically, everyone wants to get roasted by Don Rickles, but everyone doesn't want to get roasted by Trevor Noah. But who, how do you become Don Rickles and that, or Ricky Gervais? And that's, that's the problem. But I think that that's Ricky's sort of that's always been his brand. I mean, in other things that he does, like the Ricky Gervais show, which they animated for HBO with him and Carl Pilkington and Steve right. Merchant, there's always something sort of like snarky, even in his shows, like extras or whatever. Like there's sort of like a an attitude about things, whereas Trevor Noah... It's like it's a little bit unfair because it's like he's a political comedian that that hosted the Daily Show, which has a very specific on brand messaging, and yeah. then it's like now do it for musicians. I mean, but right. I think there's a there. I think what you're speaking to, even if maybe you're not aware of it directly, is there is a difference between you know going out and crushing and and sort of trouble avoidance at, on every level. You know, yeah. the producers, the network, or whatever. Exactly. We are now in a trouble avoidance mode. Yes. We are essentially saying, you know, when you when you 
when you see the car commercial where there's just the mom driving the minivan and it's a, it's a new commercial for a Toyota minivan is just going down an endless highway on the way to Vegas and it says professional driver close course do not attempt they're like what why is that on the screen because somebody said I don't want to risk it right I, I every everybody and in the name of of not risking it we're fucking our society up so we we have this thing where it's like we need diversity and we need a diversity officer and we need somebody everybody has to be like you go get a corporate job you have to show up at the sex whatever seminar and be told how to talk to women and stuff like that and you go i've been married to the same one for 30 years i go I, that's that doesn't matter. Oh, sure. Everyone is covering well, themselves. Well, legally, they need to cover their right. asses. Every, yeah. There, yeah, there's a legal version. There's a sort of spiritual version of it. And you go, look, just get this guy. He'll be nice. He'll run it down the middle. And everyone goes, yeah, but wouldn't you rather have this guy like swinging for the fences? It's like, yeah, but when you swing for the fences, sometimes you strike out. So let's just choke up. Make contact and let's all get out of here without getting sued, without the controversy, without the feuds. Like let's just let's just get through this. Yeah, but and also I think which that, is the opposite of comedy. Right. That's a, that's the opposite of comedy. Right. But that's where we're at. I agree with you. Uh, who uh, look? We just got done with COVID. There's not one comedian who is popular who I heard say shit about anything COVID. Negative, you know, vaccines or don't work or lockdowns or masks. Or whatever. No popular, no notable person right. said one word about wearing a mask or wear the thing, you know. And by the way, you don't have to make this isn't a political statement uh, when you say the thing probably came from a lab. You know, I mean, John Stewart said it eventually. Right. Uh, but masks don't work. It came from a lab. Nobody said no one popular said shit. And that's because everyone's making business decisions, and that's just where we're at right now. Absolutely. Right. I, back in the day, Fatty Arbuckle would throw a bitch through a plate glass window and go back in and finish his martini. Right. That, well, they're right now, the, everything is messaging. Everything needs to be on brand, and you, we all have to agree to the same sort of what right. everybody's but talking about. But it shall be the death of comedy. Sure. And, and creativity. Well, but I mean, yeah, because it's because it's Trevor Noah. If Blake Griffin made the same joke, would be he'd be, be right. holding him to the same standard? Like, are we judging these award shows like comedy specials or? But I also don't think like it's his. I think with Ricky, he, like he feels like a part of in a good way. I again, I'm a huge fan. Wait, Blake oh. Griffin, the basketball player. Yeah. Oh. Or if it's just like a regular. I'm celebrity. trying to think. I don't, why, I, I, where I don't he know why that's from. a first, just like a, a guy who could just you know comedian Blake Griffin. Yeah. Stand no, up. I mean like Legendary. a non comedian who's like. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I mean, look, no one really knows what the rules are, and not knowing what the rules are, it causes. Like, yep. I was, I was at a swanky table at Pebble Beach at um, at an, a, a day event, very swanky caviar. Chris has been there, um, Pebble Beach, the Quail, the Quail Lodge, right? And it's my Super Bowl. You end up sitting at tables with people you don't know because you get your food and it's tape, six people sitting around a table. You this chair open, open and yeah. you sit there and then right. you, inevitably you start talking about cars, you know. And so it's, everyone's just dressed to the nines and they're all rich guys with their Rolexes and their Italian loafers and everything. And and um, at some point, the guy's like, yeah, I had the Maserati MB7, and I went ahead and I sold the Maserati, and I got the Lambo Mura, so now I'm sitting on two Muras, and I'll have the guy, you know, the Muras are registered out of state, so I don't have to pay the in-state taxes. And, like, at some point, I go, this, ex this is exactly the conversation black people think white people have all day. And before I could finish, this super nervous chick went, oh, okay, okay, no, no, okay. And I went, no, no, I'm, I'm making a joke about it. Uh, okay, we heard, we heard I you the first time. I don't, we heard you. I hate and I'm that. like, I'm, this is a self-deprecating joke. You heard black people. No, no, they're triggered. They're pre-triggered by something. Right, so. Because they want to make sure that they didn't look like that they were an accomplice to your thought. <laughs> right. If it was right. taken out of context. Woman yeah. I've never met before. And I did we'll never show, see again. I did a show at the, at the at belly room at the, the store. And I was talking about white privilege and making jokes about it. And um, and about, you know, like, this is, it's an old joke, but I used to do where I go, I go, you gotta understand, like, we used to be the Michael Jordan of people, white guys, mm -hmm. and now we're the Michael Jordan when he played baseball of people. Mm -hmm. 
And um, there's like a off to the side, you know, they got that great like sort of that section in the belly room. Yeah. It's full of it's like all black guys. And they're laughing their heads off. And there's one white woman in the front row who's got her arms crossed. And I and I just stopped. Barry, I wasn't going after her. this. It wasn't a crowd work clip. I'm not filming. I go, what what's wrong right now? I said, who are you offended for? Right. I go, do you because 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 the people I'm talking about look like me and they look like them and we're enjoying what's happening right now. And this woman was just like pre-offended. And by the way, maybe she just didn't think I was funny, but there it seemed like she had a problem with the material. Yes. And she's being offended on behalf of people, usually who aren't in the room, but I'm like, these people are in the room. Right. right. And I go, are you guys having a great time? They on the whole side applauded and I go, who are you mad at right now? Yeah. <laughs> what, what's going on? I'll tell you who wasn't having a good time. The white cocktail waitress who wasn't getting tipped by the brothers. Oh, that's God. the person <laughs> hey, that hey, was. That's, that's the only that's person. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. We know oh, where no, you're no, going no, with no, that, I'm buddy. saying who <laughs> wasn't saying, having John? a good time. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, <laughs> I agree. So now Trevor we... Noah did make a uh, a pretty edgy joke. I thought though. Ooh, yeah, ooh. I have that here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Clip uh, two, Byron. Okay. Look yeah, this is, uh, this is this uh, is coming back from commercial, mm. and then just it was real quick. But by the way, he was... looks great. Oh, yeah. there you go, dude. What a sharp looking dude. A lot of changes. Great, great fits. Yeah, dude. Uh -huh. That white jacket looked amazing on him. All right, we're back at the Grammys with all the stars that weren't on Epstein's list. Our next award presentation is pretty special. Mm -hmm. That's right there, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, whether it was sort of Joe Coy kind of punting his or Trevor, like, if you're going to do it, live with it. You gotta, yeah. you I'd gotta say sit, live in it. That's it. my live favorite thing, yeah. live in it. When, when, um, I'm, I like when, when the room pulls back. It's okay, like everything doesn't need to be immediately like <laughs> oh, get the camera it. off me get the camera off I me. got a clip of the room pulling back oh really yeah so Jay-Z <laughs> won the like Dr. Dre global cultural impact award <laughs> um and you know he was honored. I don't think that you don't think Jay-Z feels good enough about himself by now no no he no. no after, <laughs> after last theory. night he does he's got a 200 million dollar house in my Malibu. theory is you want Jay-Z at this award so you gotta give you gotta him, get like, him you gotta somehow. Give him something yeah. well maybe you want be oh you do want Beyonce do you hear yeah, what's happening last too. next year he's winning the Jay-Z award <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> exactly right. they gotta get him they gotta get him back baby so he wins and he's he's thanking he's thanking Dr. Dre he's thanking the Academy and then he starts talking. Uh, he sa he starts uh, criticizing the academy a little bit and uh, trying to defend his wife, Beyonce. So here's this. Really oh, subjective because you know it's music and it's opinion based. But you know some things. You know, I don't want to embarrass this young lady, but she has more Grammys than everyone and never won album of the year. Beyonce. So even by your own metrics, that doesn't work. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I mean, think about on. that. The most Grammys. Never won album of the year. That doesn't work. And she's just standing there. So um, a lot of people... Her? Is That's her. Yeah, I'm blonde. The next one was his daughter. Oh, okay. Um, and a lot of people comparing that to Kanye West mm -hmm. doing the MTV Awards saying, hey, Beyonce should have won this. So... A lot of people defending Beyonce from the stage, but I mean, it is his wife. And then... Did you see Trevor Noah's suit, by the way? In that shot, all leather. Yeah. Oh, he bro, he, he looking fire. Yeah, he had some. He had a really good style. Anyway, so all sorry, the didn't nice. derail. Okay. Uh, um, and then hold on, uh, Jonathan, let me intervene here. Um, you didn't know it was one foot in college and two foot in pro. No, <laughs> I'm a coach. Okay. I'm a, you, a coach in commercials. Spiking a football, smashing a football. Whipping. I think whipping, whipping is what a I said. football. <laughs> and now you're ground. obsessed with Trevor Noah's physique, bro. Is there something you want to say? Yes. On this show involving your sexuality. I will tell you, this I don't would be know. the time. Uh, this is a safe environment to just be open about your sexuality. I'm not a fan people of, are talking. Um, and I just think it'd be a no kids, right? I, I don't um, like football, but I am a fan bachelor. of the pig skin. <laughs> um, I don't, the truth is, I don't know anything how about, about the, football. How about the lamb skin? Right. The lamb skin, whatever. And where it's going. The, the latex you ball. Like the the I'm leather just skin saying. suit. I, 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 mean, I know everything about basketball, I feel like. I know nothing about football. I, I don't want to put you... You shouldn't be defensive. And I know everything about glory holes. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know everything about getting in a man's end zone. Let me finish. You know, when you said the one foot, two thing, I, uh, two foot, I look the I other love way. tackling dudes. Okay. Give me a second yeah. here. Okay. Um, so Swift or Kelsey in terms of just one night? Um, why not both? Okay. And I was going to say right. that. that's yeah, what yeah, I yeah, that's you know. what I was... Okay. Sorry, uh, where, and then Jay-Z right? went on to criticize the Academy <laughs> even more. <laughs> You know, some of you 
Some of you gonna go home tonight and feel like you've been robbed. Some of you may get robbed. <laughs> Some of you don't belong in the category. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that was it. No, when I get nervous, I tell the truth. So a lot of people talking about his acceptance speech where he's criticizing and telling people, you, look, you don't even belong in these categories. You know the beauty? I mean, what any, anybody who's listening who's a loser, hold your head up high. Because no matter where you get to, how much money you have, how many accolades, $200 million house in Malibu, you always f got beef. And yes. you always feel slighted. Absolutely. And I just remember... When I was talking to Stallone at uh, Maria Menounos' party, and he was talking about being disrespected, you know, he was like punching his hand. He's like, oh, Ben F, like, mad damn it. Ever. How about the guy with the four franchises that have made, you know? And I was like, oh, still a beef. So yeah. Still a beef. The man leads four franchises that make 200 kajillion dollars combined. Feels dis way, disrespected. As a beef. He's still working. I believe he's the only person to have a number one movie in the 70s, 80s, 90s. To the, every single, since the 70s, he's had a number one movie of the decade because he was just in Suicide Squad and he played King Shark. So he, I'm saying he's still relevant. It's not like this guy who's like, I'm not doing it anymore. He's still working. People still love this guy and he still has a beef with people. Yeah. Everybody, no matter how many... Grammys you have, yeah. no matter how much money you have, and no matter how many franchises you have, it's not enough. Feel, it's it's, but it's not that it's not enough because I'm know, talking about me. Oh. I don't have enough. You know, let me finish. <laughs> one Grammy's enough, or one Oscar's enough. No, they always feel like they've been looked over, yeah, disrespected, not appreciated. Oh, um, Travis Scott during his performance, he he was yelling, yeah, about he it. did. Over, I was overlooked. Like they said to me I, ten I, times, I, I, and then he took folding chairs and started destroying his set. You know who else said that? Where Meryl Streep? Yeah, Meryl. during his performance, his, yeah, he performed a he performed and just started. It's it's it's, it's like it's an, an epidemic. It's like uh, Jay Z between first off. Your wife, you want to talk about an earner? You yeah. want to talk about an earner? I know. You, she's making 10 kajillion dollars. She's doing okay. Bringing it all back. But, but generationally, I don't think anybody, the thing is, weirdly enough, it, I, like, I think if she's thought of, it, like, and has been for a very long time, is top tier. Yeah, legend. L like, le and she's young. And she is considered legend yeah, already. She's a, iconic. Uh, iconic. His, his, Generational. I'm gonna. His, his thing is like she's got all these Grammys, but she doesn't have Grammy, you know, album, album of the, of the year. year. It's it's like saying, uh, well, uh, Dan Marino has all these stats. He should have Super Bowl trophies. <laughs> and it's like, nope. He's just got yeah. all. Sorry, Dan Marino is a professional football oh, player. Right. I know him playing for the. There's I, a team in Miami. I know him from Ace Ventura. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Oh, he was in right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the porn I directed. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. All but right. You're right. It's yeah, called just Smooth as a Dolphin. Beyonce, like, just make a good full album. Um, so, <laughs> so let's That's see. Annie Lennox, Annie Lennox uh, performed uh, the In Memoriam. Uh, so yeah. did Stevie Wonder. He played. He did something with uh, um, Burt uh, Bacharach. Burt Bacharach. Bacharach, Bacharach yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and there was like uh, Fantasia did a Tina Turner tribute. But Annie Lennox did a Sinead O'Connor Mm. Nothing compares to you at her version. Did and she rip up the Pope at the end? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, no, but she did do something at the end. So let's watch a little bit of her rendition. Nothing compares to you. I said, nothing compares. Nothing compares to you. If she doesn't compare to Sinead. Singing this song. The ceasefire, peace oh. in the world. I, I love all the heroes. Like peace in the world. Here, here. I got a, I got a laundry list. You ready? Yeah. Uh, no child should ever go to bed hungry. Okay. Everyone should have world class health care. Sure. And um, we should have peace. Yeah. Peace in the world. Peace in the Middle East. All right. I'm gonna go to my office and rub one out watching you porn. You guys. Yeah, take care of this. Yeah, who's would you, would disagreeing with that? I, I, it's the blowhardiest. Yeah. Yes, it, yeah, people said like, "Oh, that's what Sinead O'Connor would have done." So yes, they're, they're nothing. Really... <laughs> what you're doing is nothing. No, and, of course. And I say Comparing all the you. time, you're satiating people because they go, "Oh yeah, okay." Finally, Feels somebody good. gets it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
tell Hamas to stop executing Jews, and then maybe we could move on in, in your quest for peace. The Although Middle East- Annie will never say that. <laughs> So that's the comedy. The, they stopped the war to watch the Grammys. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. And, and she didn't sound great. Uh, yeah. And uh, Stevie Wonder, by the way, he did a Tony Bennett tribute, not Burt Becker. Excuse me. Oh. Um, and also there's a – oh, if we're talking about fit checks, Jonathan, let's Please. look at Lenny Kravitz. Fit checks. He was there. Worst fucking cereal of my childhood. <laughs> fit checks. <laughs> fit checks. All fucking grain. It's all wool. <laughs> no, honey. <laughs> Man, <laughs> yeah. cleaned you All out. Health, no flavor. Fit checks. Bro, I almost wore that today. What do you think of Lenny Kravitz's uh, outfit? I would say take. there's probably like one person on the planet who could pull that off, and I think he's doing it. He's doing it. All right. I'm Okay. I'm angry at Lenny Kravitz. The reason I'm angry at Levi, Lenny Kravitz is I hate it when a guy just looks gets to look cool and be the coolest person. So cool. And then every time they put a mic in front of him, he's like, it's all about love. I just need love. Yeah, and I'm about love, and that's what I'm trying to introduce. and world so peace. He's figured it out. It's like, and everyone goes, "Oh, did you hear what he said? He's so smart." Like I'm fucking that nine year olds. It's that shit that nine year olds yeah, say. Yeah, like yeah. you fucking imbecile. And he remade American Woman, and that song was dead and gone. And I was like, "Good, I'll never have to hear the world's shittiest song ever again." And then he came out with American Woman, and oh boy, here we go, round two of the worst part of my childhood, American Woman. Which is a shit song. It sucked then. It sucked when Lenny did it, and some other fucking guy's gonna cover it again. It's gonna suck again. Speaking mm-hmm. of covers, Ugh. they did uh, Tracy Chapman played with Luke Combs' uh, Fast Car. Oh, it was great. That one was a really it's good. It's a great song. I mean, yeah, you can't talking about Revolution. It's her best song though. But they always play the other song. And Annie fucking Lennox with Sweet Dreams. If I fucking hear that <laughs> shit song ever again, I'm gonna drive into a pile of bricks. It's such a shit song. I don't get. I don't. I don't get how we get people to like shit music. That's what I. I know they hear it enough, and then they think they like it. But how does this work? We confuse. Nostalgia and repetition for enjoyment. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, so Lenny Kravitz looked looked really good. Uh, now the album of the year, they had a surprise presenter, mm. Celine Dion, mm. which was pretty epic. Yeah, standing ovation as soon as she as soon as she walked out. Sure, she she, she looked great. She, she spoke great. She also has like find out what her syndrome is. Because I'm telling you, what they do with syndromes is they they give it names, right? And then stiff the, person syndrome. <laughs> that's not a, that's not a name though. They right. give it names like he's got progeria. You know what I mean? Uh, but we name shit all the time, so we don't have to say, right. you know, oh, uh, oh, so you have Crohn's? I have shits in my pants all the time. Disease? Yeah, like that. That we don't want to say it. Oh, that's something. I, I think I have that. She, yeah. <laughs> Has st- stiff persons yeah, syndrome? Progressive What's the stiffness me- in the body and severe muscle spasms. I'm saying, let's give it a name. What's the medical term? It's just called stiff person syndrome, which yeah, again- Yeah, it's so rare that they haven't given a medical term <laughs> yeah. yet. Again, we avoid going shits his pants syndrome right. or piss his blood syndrome or, or whatever. We, you know, we, we Lou Gehrig disease. I was just going to say, that's you know, go, what I was thinking. We pick a baseball great name. Yeah. Nope, not- nope. No, he. She could have had Manny Moda syndrome. Oh, they're going to call. Hold on, her, that's a professional baseball player. I know. Uh, yeah, okay, I, so. that. Uh, but th- this is going to be called Celine Dion syndrome. That's what they need to do. That's yeah. what they because stiff person syndrome sounds horrible. No, it sounds like Viagra. Uh, I got stiff <laughs> stiff person syndrome down here. I've had it for eight hours. So then, then I have that. I'm sorry, everybody. I have yeah, that. bro. I'm on it right now. All right, I'm talking Zub- about Dan Marino, Zuby. <laughs> Zuby is uh, out there, rapper, author, social commentator, which I I love. Um, we're gonna bring him in, right? Yeah. Take a break here. Did you swap him out with uh, Jonathan Kite? Jonathan Kite Comedy dot com is where you go. I read your plugs while you're uh, shaking the dew off the lily. When I was uh, shitting the the my pants syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you have shit Haynes syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, we'll bring in Zuby right after this. Let me tell you about BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. The best relationships happen when both people put the work in to make a great relationship. Therapy, it's uh, a big deal. And uh, relationships, 
a big deal. I mean, you get good relationships, you get a lot of real good results. And like I said, best way to have a good relationship is get some therapy. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, convenient and flexible. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Take care of yourself and your relationships this year and do it with better help. Am I right, Dawson? Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. Thrive Market for money, health, and convenience. Be smarter about eating. Thrive Market, all your grocery and household essentials online. Thrive Market carries brands with the highest quality ingredients and sourcing methods. They restrict hundreds of ingredients across their food and cleaning categories. Whether you want organic, low sugar, gluten-free, or more, curate your own shopping experience with just a few clicks. Save money on every single grocery order, 30% on average. Yeah, and by the way, you can feel it when you go to the supermarket these days. We've seen the prices thrive. Thrive Market is where you save, not where you spend. When you join Thrive Market, you also help a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join, they give. It's Thrive Market, right, Dawson? Join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash Adam for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Adam. Thrivemarket.com slash Adam. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, Eddie from California. I thought about you the other day. Having fun, carousing at night, hit the the in and out to get a burger, you know how you do? The family in front of me, all wearing masks. In line, get their food, go to the table, take their masks off and eat. Oh, a family of brain surgeons for sure. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Well, one of my favorites back in studio, Zuby, rapper, author, social commentator. He's got a children's book out called The Candy Calamity. It's available at candycalamity.com. And the podcast, which I'll be on, is called Real Talk with Zuby. Good to see you, Zuby. Good to see you, Adam, man. Always a pleasure. Yeah, I think lately... I'm just looking for sane voices out there, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm attracted to sane voices. And I found myself following, talking to, listening to people that are not in my demo. I have not, I had formerly sort of had nothing to do with or ever thought about, but you go, oh, that guy's sane. Mm. And he's saying normal things. And now they're attacking him for saying normal things. And now I'm a fan of that guy. And I feel that way with you, Zuby. Respect, man. I appreciate it. I, I was actually just thinking that it's been almost five years since really? I was first in here, I think. I yeah. believe it was, tw- was it 2019? 2019. It was 2019. And 2019 doesn't sound like five years ago to me. But um, yeah, it was about four and a half years ago. So we've uh, been in this strange period, which many people refer to as, as clown world. I often think that we entered it around 2012. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually think that with the pendulum is, is is I think we're at the early stages of the pendulum swinging back. I think we've passed the peak of the the wokeness and the madness, and I think that the exhausted majority is just tired of the excesses of it. And I think that, re- like you said, regardless of demographic, sector, career, occupation, even national boundaries, all the same people seem to be finding each other over the past decade. And I think that that is a beautiful thing. I think we're seeing all sorts of strange and interesting uh, collaborations and meetings. And I don't even know exactly how to describe it, but due to the beauty of the internet and social media, as much as it can be maddening and frustrating, all the same people are finding each other and have been finding each other. Yeah, and I'm curious, like what has enabled this to happen, to, to, to make people think things that are bizarre and untrue. Mm. And 
patently false and, and sort of can't work. Like, so to me, a lot of these ideas are just ideas that can't work. So mm-hmm. the cars are being stolen, cars are being carjacked, cars are being whatever. And the city council wants to sue Kia and Mazda <laughs> or whatever for all these. And you go, okay, that but that could never work. Yeah, but that's our idea. Like, our, we're going to defund the police mm-hmm. and we're going to replace them with community ambassadors. We'll give them whistles they can blow if they see a crime. And then, but but then what's going to happen? Or, you know, we'll take the homeless and, you know, we're not going to make it illegal to camp on a sidewalk. Everyone has the right to camp on a sidewalk. Okay, now this, you know. Mm-hmm. So what it is is horrible ideas that get implemented and then we find out they didn't work but they couldn't work. Yeah. And but it's all for me everything is like dogs in an airport. You would never bring a dog <laughs> in an airport. Nobody would ever bring a dog in an airport, but then somebody said, "Well, if it's your service dog, then maybe you can bring your dog." And now dogs are filled with airports are filled with dogs. All mm-hmm. right. So what I'm saying is is here's here's what I'm deriving. Where's this coming from? Like how did we get fucking crazy in such a short period of time, and my theory is that when the majority of society has to work with their hands, and they have to put things together, and they have to essentially be in an environment, could be a mill, a logging camp, putting metal together, putting wood together, bad ideas get you killed like fast. Mm-hmm. When you, you can't, if you're building the Golden Gate bridge you can't have a bunch of bad ideas and a bunch of feelings yeah because it, you won't finish the bridge and a bunch of people will die along the way and if you do finish the bridge first car that goes across it's going to fall off it because mm-hmm. your ideas are bad we got everybody who used to formally work with their hands and women too you're sewing you know the stuff you have to do we needed to do and we put them on a college campus and then we moved him from a college campus into a cubicle with some air conditioning. And then he sat there and they started thinking about bad ideas because they don't have <laughs> tangible skills and they they don't think in a linear way. No guy I ever worked construction with or did real work with has these batshit crazy ideas. No. And I think that's what it is. Is or, or Give me your thoughts. Man, this is a huge question. I mean, this is a, you could have, people have written entire books on this topic. Um, it's, it's a multivariate issue. I think that's one of the things that's going on. It, it's a lot of different things. Man, I can approach this from so many ways. I, I agree totally with you that these first world problems are largely a problem of comfort. It's uh, suffering from the success of our own countries, achieving such a level of material comfort and ease of survival for pretty much the first time in human history where you can even afford to entertain these kind of goofy ideas, let alone implement them. I think that it's got deeper philosophical and religious connotations as well, though. I think that if you look at all the things that traditionally keep societies sane and stable, all of those things have been attacked from multiple angles, both directly and indirectly. You've had a massive, massive decline in religion, Christianity specifically, which is a very fundamental bedrock of all Western society, whether you're talking about the USA, UK, Canada, Australia, Western Europe, all the countries which are have been succumbing to the secular religion of wokeness recently, massive decline in that, increase in uh, fatherless homes, increase in broken families, some of these things, the It takes decades for the results to cascade. As you said, there's this delayed effect where you can implement an idea in the 1960s or 70s, and you might think that it's fine, and then you start seeing it bearing fruit in the 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. There's things that that we're doing right now, some of them I can very clearly think of, which in 10 to 20 years' time, we're going to be seeing massive devastation from those bad ideas which are happening right now. So there's been an attack on faith. There's been an erosion of family. With that has come an absence of meaning and purpose. And I think that nature abhors a vacuum. I believe that human beings are fundamentally religious creatures. Uh, over I believe, Somewhere around 90% of people around the world right now do believe in some type of God or high, higher power. And when you don't, people are going to try to replace that in many ways. So lots of the ideas you're talking about, I think people are looking for social, cultural, and political realm solutions to spiritual realm problems. 
and then they're being surprised when it's not working. So there's lots of the vestiges of ideas of Christianity, say compassion. Lots of the things I think you're talking about are sort of toxic compassion, Mm -hmm. right? A lot of these progressive ideas, some of these things that are devastating places like San Francisco or certain parts of LA or whatever. And it's taking what is generally considered a, a good trait and taking it to such an extreme with no temperance where it's like, oh, okay, the compassionate thing to do is just let people do all the drugs they want on the street or let them camp out everywhere. Or actually maybe maybe even to let them steal because we wouldn't want to be uh, heavy handed because that's mean. You look at the whole fat acceptance, body positivity thing, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of telling someone, hey, actually being this out of shape and this obese is bad for you and you're cutting your lifespan short. It's like, no, 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 you can be healthy at any size. You're beautiful, whatever. So I think a lot of these factors are all just coming together and then you accelerate it with technology and social media. And we're just at a point of humanity where we've never been before. I agree. And the compliance part is scary to me Mm. because this is really a handful of people with horrible ideas and a much larger group of scared people who just don't want trouble. Mm -hmm. And they, I think, prey upon the fact that most people's default setting is to be left alone and not to stick out and feel the hammer. As the adage goes, the nail that sticks out gets hammered, right? Mm. And I saw it firsthand during COVID. I, I, I know, I know that people weren't complying, but they were doing it quietly. Like I, you know, first things first. I got reprimanded by a uh, young woman at the airport on my way out. Not about COVID, about baggage size, but (laughs) she had a mask on, but her mask was under her chin. Mm -hmm. It was on her chin. It it wasn't one nostril peeking through the mask. It was a mask that she felt compelled to wear, but I could see her mouth moving and spittle coming out of it when she was yelling at me that I had to go check my bag. So my point is, is is she scared of COVID? No. Right. That's, That's my point. And then all the other people who claim to be scared of COVID are not acting scared of COVID. They're scared, like, you know, when there's a pandemic and it's a real pandemic and it's like in the movies Mm -hmm. where your skin starts melting and you lose, you go blind and you know, you, you beg your, you you know, if there's a real pandemic, real pandemics, you have to have the conversation with your buddy where you go, if this thing ever gets me, you kill me Mm -hmm. right now. (laughs) You kill me, not go get me some halls and some mentholatum rub. And I'm going to take a few days off work. No, you have to kill me with a shovel. If I get this thing, that's how real (laughs) pandemics work. So the fact that people are just milling about, you know, they're in restaurants, you know, it's like, oh, they make you eat on the patio. Yeah. You got to wear the mask when you're walking through, but then you're taking off. Yeah. I mask up in between bites. I'm flying commercially. The flights are full. You know what I mean? Like nobody. No. But everyone's been deputized to act and say a certain thing, yeah. even if they're not living it or believing it. Yeah, man. Going back to that, that the COVID era, you know, we're <laughs> very much past the tail end of it now. But that was such a bizarre time period. I mean, I actually went to eight different countries during it. And what you're describing, it, I've never seen at scale globally such a mass, a mass psychological operation. Mm-hmm. It was very bizarre going from country to country. And these bizarre policies and behaviors that you're describing are in almost every single place. But then also there were moments where it's like, oh, wait, I mean, in 2021, I went to Texas, I went to Florida, I went to Hawaii, California, Maryland. Wait, how are the rules and restrictions so different in all these places, even between L.A. and Orange County? How come I passed this magic line and all of a sudden this thing has gone or it gets to a certain time? It, it was how really did Disneyland remain closed here and Disney World stay open in Florida. Like they're yes, just the science, two, the science, That's the right. science. That's yeah, every, the every, science. Yes. every place had different science, you know. Um, but I think the most interesting thing about that, which is the point you're making, is is the human psychology. Yes. It wasn't the, the virology or the uh, epidemiology. It was the human psychology at play that was just deeply fascinating and also disheartening and frightening. I tell everybody, COVID didn't learn anything about viruses, but I learned everything about people, and it's sad. Yeah, and it validates it because if you look at human history, I mean – 20th century being the most obvious set of examples. I think 
we look back at those times at certain things and you if you're like me you've always asked the question through your life how how did that happen how did they let it go so far why didn't someone to say something yeah. why did so many people go along with something that wasn't makes making sense and so on and then you live through something which is not identical but the same psychology is at play and you're like oh this is how it happens right? right i mean let's not pretend that in certain countries and jurisdictions i mean they got to the point of building camps they got to the point of building camps to put people who didn't want to take the shot yeah like think about that does that not well, have some it. does that not have some concerning echoes and people are like oh no no this is different this is about health this is about safety it's like wait so whether or not someone takes the shot they can still transmit it Right. But you're implementing segregation and you're doing unvexed only lockdowns and you want to implement this and you want to put people in camps. I mean, there were some countries where you couldn't you couldn't pump gas without proof of shot. You couldn't really? get on a bus. Yep. You couldn't get on a train. In Austria, they did an they did a lockdown just for unvexed people. In some uh places in Germany, for example, in schools if you were a child who was unvaccinated you had to stand up at the front of the class every day every morning and explain to your peers why you hadn't taken the shot most people aren't aware of these things cuz most people didn't travel most people were just in their city state or nation mm -hmm. but i uh, due to due to the fact that i just talked to so many thousands of people uh, in every single country and people were just sending me uh, telling me what it was like where they are um I went to Australia as well in uh after they'd finished their craziness in 2022 mm -hmm. I went out to Australia I actually spoke at CPAC over there. Um and I was just talking to people about what they'd experienced over the past 2 years. I mean, I went to Sydney and I went to Melbourne and Melbourne had the longest lockdowns in the world. They had over 500 days of lockdown. Mm -hmm. And when I say lockdown, I don't mean in the UK it was locked down but you you could it wasn't really enforced right you could mm -hmm. go out things were closed but you could go out you could spend all day outside if you want you could walk around whatever australia they had the drones out you couldn't go they had bar, they had a uh, roadblocks you couldn't go more than 5 kilometers right. from your house you could only be allowed outside 1 hour per day and it it was all it was all very rigidly enforced in certain parts yeah and i talked to people who went through that and four separate people i spoke to just private conversations i had four people just telling me their stories just start crying midway through conversation. I was just like, "Geez, these people have like genuinely been genuinely been traumatized." Yeah, it it so found something interesting about it. Yeah, in Australia, I think it was the one where like the guys smoking in the park and the cops are tackling him yeah. and, and stuff like that. It's yeah. all they had mass people just running. Dude, the they cop. had um right. they, they they had full-on police in riot gear shooting people. I I met people who'd been shot by police. Really? Met, yeah. They had uh, rubber bullets. Right. They, I had met people who had been hospitalized. Right. The police came out because they had the anti-lockdown protests and the police came with their shields and batons and rubber. This is all supposed to be in the name of your health. All right. So let's see if we can <clears throat> make me a little more <laughs> unpopular. Um <laughs> let's go. I all right. All right. So I like to talk about chick think everyone gets angry. Okay. Um but I've noticed that these places that we're speaking of who locked down the most and had the most draconian rules and stuff it's either run by a woman or suffered from chick think like a <laughs> Gavin knew some things like a chick uh -huh. in California so like this this think and what i know with women is when you defy them they have a they have a greater vengeance quotient than men do which is counterintuitive it's like women i always tell everyone women are more violent than men they just can't back it up you mm. know what i mean and i i said all right don't believe me no one believes me i said oh, look here's a simple experiment anyone said bread with a woman who, who's like you're in the kitchen and your back's turned and you step back and you step on her foot her arm comes flying out <laughs> uh, guys don't do that guys wrestle guys fight guys go in the cage Guys, like instinctively, they go into combat, but step on a woman's foot and see how fast the hand comes out. Um, they don't. Every every one, every woman that was running, you know, Lori Lightfoot in Chicago or Gretchen Whitmer and uh, in, in Michigan. Michigan or out here, we had uh, our Katie Porter. We had uh, no, we had the COVID leader, oh, whatever her name was, Doctor Doctor Barbara Ferrer. Doctor okay. anyone that got. Anyone that you defied mm. got angry and fucking came down on you hard. Like 
like you had Lori Lightfoot in Chicago yelling at people that were walking along the river saying, I will arrest you. Like, yeah. you will get thrown. At. Like, like the the folks that have a little more dude think, and it's, it's also more Republican right wing kind of think, is it's not my job to threaten to lock up, you know, citizens. They mm. go right there fast. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't know. I don't know how relevant the uh, the gender aspect of it was, um, just based on a on a global view from what I saw around the world in all the different countries. Um, obviously, most world leaders are male, yep. so it's hard to see. Um, but no, in my in my I, world, okay, Justin Trudeau is a chick. <laughs> oh, fair that's, enough. Fair that's enough. what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, if we're gonna say, like, say how all these s- guys are chicks, I mean, one thing I did observe strangely in in all my travels is, um, I actually found disappointingly that um, most of the so I experienced a lot of um, Karen behavior mm-hmm. um, in all in all my travels and and my defiance, and it was mostly from men. Oh wow! Yeah, it was mostly from men. Whenever someone like. With with a couple exceptions, when it was I'm on a plane and there's the flight attendants and they're they're done over your nose, but you got to put that on. You got it was it, the biggest Karens were men, wow. not not mas- not generally masculine men, um, but it was mostly men. Even just walking down the street in certain places, like when I went to Portugal um, or the few conflicts I had in the UK or whatever, it wasn't it wasn't women. It was dudes. It was the guys who were like more scared and i know this is anecdotal but a lot i the most of the people i know who at least 50 percent of the people i know who like really really stood up against it were were women mm. they were women it was uh the women who were more defiant like the kind of mama bear type attitude mo- maybe mothers even specifically <clears throat> i found pushed back against it harder this is in my observation so of the thousands of people i interact with and things i saw because i remember being like guys like what are y'all doing i remember posting <laughs> that meme of you know it's got the guys at d-day and it's, right. you know <laughs> it's, it's you know men with a, facing a 99 percent chance of death back in uh you know, 40, ba- yeah, 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 back in the 40s. And uh, and then it's got, you know, the guy with the mask on hiding behind the sofa. And it's, you know, men facing a 99.9% survival rate in, yeah. in 2020. Like I posted that meme a whole bunch of times because that was actually, that was closer to my experience. Even online, the vast majority of people who were trying to give me hell. Even, I have people trying to de-pla- get me banned from, get me banned from Instagram and X for, uh, you know, speaking out against the mandates and so on. Ninety percent dudes. Well, I wrote a book fifteen <laughs> years ago called yeah. <laughs> Fifty Years Will All Be Chicks," and I now I'm, yeah. I'm saddened by this. I do. And I do agree with you, uh, especially as a, a guy who just is old school dude mm. guy dude bro. Which I always thought that's the greatest name ever, dude bro. <laughs> guy dude bro. Guy dude bro. Um, it saddens me how many guys caved immediately oh, yeah. and just, but. I think none of the guys, so I got to do a kind of an A and a B. I got to toggle between the white collar, comedy, Hollywood, Hmm. um, creative guys, and then the blue collar guys who worked on my race cars and built stuff with. I would go back and forth between those, those two groups. The blue collar guys, it never came up. Mm. There was no mass. There was yeah. no discussion. No one said, "Oh, before you hand me that de-handled whole hog <laughs> that Milwaukee makes with a half inch check, you better wipe it down with some Clorox." Like it, it, it didn't exist in that world, mm. and it was paramount in this other world. And that's where I started to kind of put my theorem mm. together. That- that's interesting. I mean, I would argue that in the modern time we live in due to the nature of media, politics, social media, and all of that, one could make an argument that more effeminate men, at least in the way they think, have a much bigger megaphone and more influence than that latter group of men. They have no influence and no megaphone. Exactly. Uh, Nor do they want it. I I think think the first, the the, the former are saying the most, right? So they're trying to... And influencing other people, right? Because if you're in the media or if you're in politics, you're the one with the megaphone telling everyone else what to do and what to think and what to inject and what mask to wear and all of that. But it's also, and I think this is really important, I think we're getting away from it. 
It is a risk um, assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got my guys, and uh, they're at the other shop, and they're putting up 40-foot-long I-beams for something. And the the 40-foot-long, they're handling a 40-foot-long I-beam. And a 40-foot-long I-beam that's, you know, a foot up and a foot wide weighs tons. Mm -hmm. And they're putting it up, and, you know, at some point they got it, a kind of jack stand holding it in place. It's like eight feet off the ground, and the two jack stands and a cross, you know. And so I'm walking over there, and I'm like, this jack stance, is that enough, you know, for this? Yeah. And they're like, well, each one's rated for 5,000 pounds, and there's two of them, and then it's only holding up half the I beam, and the I beam's 8,000 pounds or whatever. And it's a kind con- and I'm looking up at this thing, and I'm going, okay, but if this thing falls, you're not going to get hurt, you're going to get killed. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we don't have the time to make it completely. 100% safe. Mm-hmm. 100% safe means now we got to get two forklifts on each side and 10 jack stands. It's like, no, we got one forklift and two jack stands. And so you sit there and you look at everything and you go, this is reasonably, responsibly safe, what mm-hmm. we're doing, but it's not without risk. And there's also catastrophic mechanical failure. The forklift could be, in the you know, hydraulic hose could shoot off and the thing could come down or whatever. But all they do all day, whether you're firing up a bandsaw or hanging an I beam, is a is a risk assessment. Yes. It's just assessment, assessment. And if you if you if you go too fast, you'll get killed mm-hmm. or horribly injured. And if you go too slowly, you don't get done. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you want to build the Golden Gate Bridge in two years, you have to move. Mm-hmm. You could do it in ten years, it would be safer. But you want to do it in two years. So in your mind, there's a dance that's going on constantly. Every time you fire up a tool, yep. you're doing an assessment of what, do I need to wear gloves? Mm-hmm. Do I need to wear eye protection? All right, well, if I'm cutting metal, maybe I should put some goggles on, but I'm cutting a two-by-four, so I'm not worried about that. You know, it, that's all this. And yeah. it just goes and goes and goes. Well, if you don't do that ever and then some mystery virus shows up, you're not going to be able to assess it, yeah. which is what we saw. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that describes one segment of the population. I think that describes the people who were genuinely terrified of the virus. There's a percentage of people who their behavior was genuinely driven because they were deathly afraid of catching this thing. And their viewpoints and words and actions were actually consistent with that. I think there's a much bigger segment of the population where it wasn't that. It wasn't the genuine fear. It was a combination of other things. I think you had a segment where you definitely had a segment where it was just the whole virtue signal aspect. Yeah, social acceptance. Yep. Not even just acceptance, but social grandstanding, Mm. right? I'm a better person for you because (laughs) I'm where, but people who put the, you know, the the mask in the profile photo, taking the selfies of them getting the shot, putting their booster status in their bio, all of that stuff, right? Just like uh, you can signal a good person throw, oh, it's June, let me throw this flag in my bio. Let me throw that, let me put up my black square for BLM, whatever it is. I think in the past and in most of society, like the guys you're describing who are doing this manual labor, do you know how they prove that they're a good person or they're a good man? They, a lot they, of it's based on their work. Yeah, they, their work and their character, right? Yeah. They, you, they, you just are a good man. Yes. But now, rather than actually doing anything useful or good, you can just virtue signal. You can just put a certain hashtags in your bio, do certain very low cost things, which within a certain group... No, Elevate. listen, Annie Lennox just announced we needed to end wars. And then her, <laughs> oh, really? work, her work was done. Now yeah. she can fist in the air. Yeah, yeah. it's just the, it's the ultimate virtue signal. And I think it works in multiple ways because you have people who are basically dorks, who are low status, who have never had any sort of influence or heroism or whatever, right? Like these flight attendants or people in restaurants, you're going, pull your mask over your nose, do this. Do. In any other time in history, you've got nothing, you've, you've got no power over 
most people, right? You're actually yeah. in a very low status position, yeah. but now you are temporarily elevated to being the person. It doesn't matter. These people could be in first class. They could be businessmen. Oh. They could, and you, you've got the, you need to do this. You need to stand here, sit here. I just ran into <laughs> this 23 year old chick. There you go. And I, I'm going through security with my bag. Now I've had bags gate checked. Mm-hmm. And I've checked bags at the counter, but I've never been stopped going through security with my bag. And she's got she's got the mask around her chin, and she stops me. She goes, "That that bag's too big." And I said, "Oh well, I'll just go through, and uh, they can <laughs> gate check it." You know. And she goes, "No, take it back." Oh, I, I was a long ways away, and there's a line at the counter. Take it back to check it. Take it back. Yeah, oh, and God. I go. I carry this bag everywhere. I've mm. never checked this bag. I bring it ever if it's right in the overhead. And she goes, take it back. And I'm like, well, I'm running a little bit late now. And it's all the way back. And then there's a line. And I got clear. And how about I just blow through it? And, and she goes, the template. There's the bag template, mm. you know, oh, thing oh, over gosh. there. I go, it'll fit. I, I bring it everywhere. <laughs> I always bring it everywhere. She goes, try the template. Put it in. I go, okay. I go, I drop it right in the template, right? Okay. But it's hanging out an inch on oh each side, lengthwise. Not. It's usually the template is like width, wise, fat, thickness. Is, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. what I mean? dropped it right in. They say, "I go see fits." She goes, "No, it's hanging out oh an inch gosh. and a half. Mm-hmm. Take it back." And I'm like, "Now, here's a here's a here's a sensitive question. <laughs> a, she's got some power. Yep. B, she's black." And she's being told over and over again that we live in a racist society Mm -hmm. and it's rich white dudes my age, (laughs) six foot two with a first class ticket. This is your mint class ticket. I got my mint ticket on JetBlue and I'm the reason her mama isn't doing well because, uh, but honestly, how long, this is a 23 year old black woman. She grew up on a steady diet of inherent racism baked in racist nation every end zone says end racism in a football it's baked in yes. for her she'd almost be a fool not to exact a little ounce of flesh or a little revenge mm. you know or even if it's not even if it's not something that she's thinking about it's it's there yeah Do you, you know what i mean and right. it's i think that and now i have to wonder is this a component mm. of this it, 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 <laughs> Because I get it, you're you're a black woman and you're powerless in our horrible society. But you're not powerless now. Yes, you are the sheriff. Now you're in doing this that thing exchange. where you hate, where it's, where it's like, is she being a jerk or is it because I'm white? Well, yeah, right. exactly. I was going to say this is like the the, the inverse situation that other people have, right? Because I'll have. But uh, it's a very logical it is. outcome of feeding this person this poison yeah. her whole life. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And identity politics, especially race based identity politics, has has a lot of dangers. I mean, gosh, we, how many lessons from history do we need on that one? Um, but I think that's one of the things that is just so toxic about it. But it's also one of the things why it's so appealing to people. I get asked a lot of why, why do people find the victimhood mentality and the oppressor oppressed? Why, why do people like to be an oppressed class? And I think it's primarily for um, you know, two or three reasons. I think, number one, you get some social clout for it in this day and age. Um, you know, the bigger the victim you are, the better a person you are sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the huge reasons, I think the main one is that it acts as a permanent alibi for your own failures. So Mm -hmm. if I accept all the narratives that I live in a white supremacist society and as a black man, I'm oppressed and these people are the problem and the whole system, institution, structure, all of it is set up against someone who's like me, then anytime I mess up or I fail at something or anything I do doesn't succeed, I have an alibi. Right. I can just blame. I can blame it on someone else, and I can say, "Ah, see, look, this is just that. If I were not a black person, this would not have happened, right?" You don't know the counterfactual, but you can always say that, and people actually empathize with that. And then I think the third reason, which is the vindictive one, which is that it's a it's a great cudgel. It's it's a it's a fantastic weapon. I mean, if you can walk around with this chip on your shoulder, which you can take off and just sort of whack with anyone <laughs> righteously because of your uh, immutable characteristics, then I think there will be people who who choose to use it vindictively. Um, I think we've seen some pretty high profile examples of this, in fact, where people, you know, they do something and then they, they want to hide behind their identity. They, they want to victimize other people. And then as soon as someone calls them out on it or there's some pushback, 
they're like, oh my gosh, look, this is an example of this horrible, racist, sexist, transphobic, home of like all the isms and schisms. They're all. Well, it's, it's, it's perfect because you can be, and it's going on as, as we speak with Fannie Willis or whatever her name is. Like, you just be a black woman, and then you get busted for giving some money to your boyfriend or oh, something. I don't know and this then, one. oh, this is good. And then you just go, hey, if I wasn't a black woman, it's like, yeah, why, why not? I mean, every single politician that we have out here um, who is of color or female color and something, if they ever get busted for yep. something, the first thing that comes sailing out is this is because of mm -hmm. my color and because of my gender, which I would play as well. <laughs> you know, if I got pulled over for speeding or I got caught uh, embezzling money or what from the government or whatever it was, I would do it. You're at, it's like telling people not to bring dogs to the airport mm -hmm. to do the right thing. No, you open the door to this and people are going to come through it. Yeah. All right, you have some of your tweets. We need to take a quick break. Okay. We're going to do some tweet explaining with Zuby right after this. Tommy John, your butt deserves better. Tommy John's super soft underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. Breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabrics. Feel that much more comfortable, and you'll do everything better. I'm wearing mine right now. You get into your Tommy John's, and you will not get out of them. You will be ruined for all other underwear. Try blend and modal fabrics, stretch, and uh, four times the stretch than competing brands. Tommy John moves 16 different ways, plus comfort innovations like a supportive hammock pouch and easy to access horizontal quick draw fly. Over 20 million pairs sold. Thousands of five-star reviews. Tommy John, they don't have customers. They have fanatics, and I'm one of them. I'm wearing them right now. Green with a kind of a Christmas theme, if you must know. Best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free, guarantee. Right, Dawson? Shop Tommy John and get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. Save 20% for a limited time at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. Well, good news. It's O Rewards Bonus Points Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Shop in the store, do it online to receive points and get rewards sent straight to your phone or inbox. Get two, three, four, even five times bonus points on select purchases. Receive bonus points on select items throughout the store like wiper blades, antifreeze, coolant, parts cleaner, motor oil, and more. Those bonus points can help get you to your next rewards even faster. You'll receive a $5 reward for every 150 O reward points to use on your next in-store or online purchase. Members can check points and rewards online anytime. If you're already an O rewards member and not receiving your rewards, just add an email address or mobile phone number. Get a $10 reward for updating your existing account. If you're not an O Rewards member yet, signing up is easy, quick, and simple. Just do it online at O'ReillyAuto.com or in-store at O'Reilly Auto Parts. In honor of Jim Carolla's 92nd birthday, here's a list of all the things Adam Carolla will do before he dies. Tell his team to synchronize their watches. Just one of the things Adam will do before he dies. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Zuby is here. He's got a children's book out called The Candy Calamity. It's available at candycalamity.com and the podcast, Real Talk with Zuby, which I shall be on post haste as well. A uh, lot of good ideas, and we need people with good ideas and Zuby's one of them and he he does a lot of tweeting so we thought we'd do a little tweet splain with uh Zuby Dawson it's time to tweet splain it's not really a game it's just where we ask you to explain your tweet tweet splain Almost everybody thinks they are a good person. This includes terrible people. 
In my observation, truly good people seem less certain about their goodness. They are highly aware of their propensity for wickedness and keep it under control. Vigilant rather than angelic. Mm. Okay, so I just explained where, wow, that was deep. I'm with you 1,000%. <laughs> yeah, man, this goes back to that uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn line, which is that, you know, the line dividing good and evil runs through every human heart. So I think I, the reason I tweeted that is because I think the low resolution worldview and the simplistic one and the one many people like to believe is that the world is simply just good people and bad people. Um, but virtually everybody thinks that they're a good guy. If you look at the greatest atrocities ever committed in humanity, they were done for the quote unquote greater good, right? Mm -hmm. These were people who thought, okay, the, you know, the ends justifies the means. I've got this ideology or idea or worldview we want to implement. We want to create this utopia. So we're willing to do all of this terrible stuff to make it happen, right? We want to achieve COVID zero. So let's weld people into their apartments, stop them from going outside, kill their pets, ban them from, let's just remove all of their human rights right. because uh, they could catch a cold if they were to step outside. That type of mentality. The people who were pushing that they are not thinking, oh, I'm just doing something wicked or cruel, but because they're not self-aware enough or willing to consider their own capability for wickedness, it happens. It's something that is in everybody. We have free will. All of us can choose to do good or bad, right? I could choose to leave here and go commit some some terrible crime. I have the free will to do that. Um, but because I know I'm capable of that, it, it's part of one of the things that stops me doing it. I'm constantly... I, th I think people who are genuinely good, like I'm saying there, they, they're, they're aware of their capability for wickedness mm -hmm. and they, they keep it in check. They're aware, hey, I could lie, I could steal, I could assault people, I could hurt people. I, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's a lot of deceptive things that you can do in this world to temporarily get ahead. And so I think that level of self-awareness is what makes somebody more good rather than just the sort of virtue signaling example I was giving before of just saying, oh, look, like, I put the right things in my bio, in my Twitter bio, and now no matter how horribly I treat other people, or no matter what I do, I could even you can even go out and endorse viol violence or go and commit it, and then you say, "Oh well, it was for a it was for a good cause, and so I'm still good." Yeah, I, I it always vexes me that people don't know they're those people. <laughs> I always I now have a new thing. I just have easy people and difficult people. Okay, and. There's a lot of difficult people out there, and they never know they're the difficult person. What do you mean by easy and difficult? I just mean, like, I just um, got off the road when we were talking about Rudy, my opener, and Rudy's friendly, and he's easy. He's, he's an easy person. He's not a difficult person. Mm. Like, listen, I have twins. I have a son. I have a daughter. My daughter was difficult for a period and still has the sort of leanings of a difficult person. Now, one could say, well, she's got a lot of energy and she wants to do stuff, you know, and, and sometimes that can stray into difficult because they just want to go all yeah. the time and they want to know, you know, she's she wants to go to the uh, Oscars and she reminded me last night for the 186th time if I got her tickets for the Oscars. It was it's not 150 times, we're closer <laughs> to 200 times. now. My son is not asked. I have never had an argument or even really cr cr been cross with my son because mm. he's easy. He's, he's a Labrador. You know I mean? He's just an easy person. And Rudy, the opener, he's easy. He's just easy. And nobody thinks it, but I'm easy too. And that's why me and Rudy are never going to have an argument, a, dis a disagreement, whatever, whatever it is. It'll be easy, and easy people can get along. Difficult people cannot get along, mm. and an easy person and a difficult person, the difficult person thinks the easy person is being unreasonable. Mm. I, and it, I don't know even how to describe it in a, more, in a deeper pattern. It's just I know easy people, and I know... It's a, it's a super it's a super simple equation. You just think about everyone you work with, you know, and you go, um, 
oh, you know what? We're going to have to do a show on Easter Sunday, so people are going to have to come. And you, the first, you can hear the person, the mm-hmm. one person going, uh-oh, we know who's going to have a problem with this. How do you know in advance? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or we need this person to work on a Saturday or something, and you can hear them. You can hear – you. Everyone in this office could pick out the person that was going to have a problem with whatever whatever this thing was. Mm. I'm, and I'm never saying they're bad people. Yes. They're just difficult. There's just more. You have to burn more. You have to make more accommodations for them. Mm. Easy people feel uncomfortable when you make <clears throat> accommodations. I get that. Difficult people require you make accommodations for them. They like it. You know, mm. I don't know, think Mariah Carey or something like that. Little indicators of easy are when, you know, when you go, oh, is, um, do we call you Steve or is it Steve N? And they go, right, whatever you want. Whatever. I, you say whatever you want. <laughs> like that, that, whatever you want. I I got on my, my mint first class jet blue flight. Mm. I was sitting in, in mint. I nobody was in my aisle. There's two seats, and I just went. Um, oh, I'm, I just sat next to the window because I didn't want to have everyone banging me with their luggage on the aisle yeah. while everyone is loading it. At some point, the 30 year old dude whose seat I was sitting in his seat. Okay, he got onto the plane. He like looked at me. He looked at his ticket. And he went, "Is that? I think I think maybe I'm that seat." And I said, "Yeah, I think I just." And he went, "Ah." And he just sat down. Yeah. And I went, oh, I like this guy. Because yeah, he just didn't care because he's easy. Mm. He's easy. <laughs> and there's so many fucking difficult people out there, and they have no idea who they are. Yeah, I think, man, I, as, I mean, some of that is going to just be personality. Yes. But I think some of it as well is, I think a lot of, when you think about it, so many human interactions are a type of joust for a social status. Yes. And I think that people have very different ways of doing this. I think a lot of people, especially if they've if they're accomplished and they're just secure and they have self-esteem and so on, they don't feel the need to exert power in these little um, finicky, insignificant ways. They just I, don't. Yes. They, they they don't care, right? I, I, I don't come in here and I'm like, oh, uh, you know, the the water needs to be. Exactly. It needs to be this temperature or, or, you know, M&Ms. I don't like these colored ones or just those little ways of exerting power over people to sort of elevate your status above them. Again, coming back to all the stuff with COVID, it's like you can just do this little thing. And it's like, look, I'm a little bit I'm just a little bit better than you, than all of y'all telling someone because I did this little mask up yeah. on a hiking trail. <laughs> I could never do it. Yeah. But I could see their jobs. Mm-hmm. That young lady of color who was sending me back to JetBlue to go wait in line to check my bag. I could never do that job. (laughs) Never, because I'd look at you, I'd see you're running to catch a flight. The second you drop that bag and it slid into the template, a little peeked out, you know, a little little hot dog past the bun in the template, I'd just look at that guy and just go, whatever. Yeah, who cares? I I would never, I, I, I would tell people all the time, I used to teach traffic school. They used to tell me, if anyone shows up 10 minutes late, you have mm-hmm. to keep them 10 minutes during lunch. And if they show up 20 minutes late, you got to keep them 20. And they show up more than 20 minutes late, you got to send them home. Because yeah. right. they're not getting enough hours in this class. I'd have guys walk in two hours late. Mm-hmm. Two hours, they'd come in, they go, I thought you guys were in Reseda. I didn't know we're in the... But I, and i just go, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. Why would I care? I think a lot, a lot of it is grace as well. And I think that's a concept that's largely been lost in modern well, society. It, it's golden rule, which is you have to picture yourself mm. and somebody going, when you're about to go through security, <laughs> go take your bag, yeah. go back to the counter 100 yards that way and go wait in line and pay 40 bucks to have that thing. You, you have to think, wow, what if that were me mm. having to do this? I wouldn't like it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, let's do another uh, tweet. The notion of bringing shame and dishonor upon your family name has been mostly lost in the West, as the nuclear and extended family have been systematically disintegrated. 
This, plus a hyper-liberal attitude of whatever, do whatever makes you feel good, is accelerating goofy behavior. It's one thing to make yourself look like a fool or criminal, but fear of making your whole clan look bad keeps people in check and has done throughout history all over the world. You can't disintegrate every social, religious, and cultural pillar that encourages good behavior and expect it to turn out well. We are social creatures, and incentives and disincentives are powerful. In fact, the less people regulate themselves, the more likely an authoritarian government eventually will. Ooh, I feel like I explained that one pretty thoroughly in the, in the post <laughs> itself. One, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, again, we, we live in this time of expressive individualism in the modern West, where the worst thing that somebody can do beyond, you know, something non be, not being consensual is to judge or shame another person in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And shame plays a very healthy role in society. And in most cultures around the world, and even in even still in, in many Western countries, because there's so many different families and communities out there. Shame is an important part of good behavior. Oh yeah, right. It's it's it, there's this idea of your know, shame in itself being inherently bad and pride being inherently good. Um, there's this weird sort of inversion going on, and it goes beyond the individual. Like I, we're we're all fans of individualism and individual rights and the ability for people to be seen as individuals, pursue the things that they want, and so on. But we're also all part of something. We're all part of a family, perhaps even, you know, in, we've got our immediate family and we've got our wider integrated family. You're a member of various types of communities. You don't only represent yourself. As I'm sitting here talking on this podcast or on anything, I'm very conscious and aware. I'm from a big family. My immediate family is seven people. You know, I've got 50 plus first cousins, like the Udezwe name, my last name is, it's out there. There's hundreds of people carrying carrying that name. And it's a very specific one. So if I go out there and I behave in a certain way, if I go out and I were to commit certain crimes or do certain terrible things or say certain things, it's like, you know who I'm most concerned about? I'm concerned about my mom calling me out. Hey, Zuby, I just, I just heard you on that podcast. What the heck did you just say? <laughs> right? Like that, that's the thing. And that's good. I know. Right? That's good from whether it's my parents, it's my, my, I've got four older siblings. I've got a lot of people out there. So my behavior is not just thinking, okay, is this thing illegal or not? It's like, okay, what about the, wh wh how would my family think about this? How would other people I respect think about this? What would this do to my reputation? What would God himself think about this behavior or thing that I'm doing? So having those things in place is, is good and healthy. And when I was talking about enabling goofy behavior, coming back to a lot of the bad ideas you were talking about to begin with, I think a lot of that is, again, because you, you've, if you give people, say, total liberty, right? You, you've just got liberty. You can just, as long as you're not stealing from someone or hurting someone, you can just do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, in a sane society that still has those pillars and foundations in place and a health, healthy form of social shame, mm -hmm. um, it, doesn't, it, doesn't go that, it doesn't go that crazy. Um, but in the absence of those, you're going to get more and more people who are just publicly and privately doing all sorts of crazy and weird and awful things. And they don't feel the shame that they're supposed to feel the shame for. There's certain things I see and I'm like, it, it could be as the simple as the way somebody dresses in public. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I, I'm bad. I, I would feel embarrassed to go out of my house dressed like that, right? Like, I, I don't even know, in most nations around the world, if you left the house, people are going to just be staring at you down the street, like, what on earth is this, is this guy or gal doing, right? right. Like, this, this, is, this is crazy, let alone actual behaviors that are, that are more serious. I mean, th this gets up to the point of even, you know, people committing violent crimes, people stealing, shoplifting, all this kind of thing. If they knew, hey, by doing this, the consequence isn't just that I might end up in prison or whatever, but like, my whole family is hmm. going to be disappointed. I'm going to bring disrepute across their name. Like everybody I'm connected to and represent, I'm going to make them look bad. Like it makes people double think and triple think to not do those things. Yeah. Well, they've been saying around here for about 25 years, you can't judge. And I've always been like, fuck that. I judge <laughs> all day long. And by the way, we've turned this place from a utopia into a shitbox because people decided no more judging. Yeah. We need more and more judging. Yeah. We need more character. We need more. Kids used to talk about the golden rule constantly. It never comes up. 
mm. anymore. And uh, yeah, people in societies will police themselves if you have those kind of guardrails put in place. And and it's it's like I I don't know. It's like shame exists for a reason. Mm-hmm. It's good, and it's a tool, and it should be used. It doesn't mean you shame somebody for the sake of shaming them. No. But when you don't achieve something or you get an F on your final or or you try to get into your suit pants and you can't get them buckled that you wore last year, <laughs> experience a little bit of shame mm. because then change, that's what leads to change. Yeah, like, the, the, getting the F on the paper should not feel the same as getting an A. Right. All right, <laughs> let's do one more, one more? Okay. Dawson. Looking it up, Dawson decided he was in his car. <laughs> you so. said, honestly, you said one more before. Look, I can make have one ready. Ready. Got <laughs> in his mind. So <laughs> many adults right. all over the world still believe that a politician is coming to save them. I've seen this play out so many times over my relatively short life, and it never happens. But people hold on to the fantasy. Mm. It's like the adult version of believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> Man, this one also speaks for itself. I, I just think that a lot of people want to outsource their personal responsibility and accountability to the state or to individual politicians. When I see the way that certain politicians are worshipped or the way people's entire being and emotion and self-esteem all hinges on the outcome of a certain election or something like that. I think that once you're thinking like that, you've you've already lost. You've already taken your locus of control from internal and you've handed it to someone else. Not just to someone else, but to someone else who doesn't know who you are and who doesn't care about you. Right. No, it's, it's essentially, it's like once you start buying lottery tickets, you've given up. Mm. And it, it's the exact same thing. I always scream that it's so ironic that the lottery is supposed to help the schools because it's the worst <laughs> message. If you were a guidance counselor and a 16-year-old kid said, I need some guidance, and you said, buy a lottery ticket, you would be fired. And yes. you should be fired <laughs> because that's the worst <laughs> advice you could give to a young person. But yet somehow we use that money to pay for the schools, which never get better. But there's certain things, yes, you lose your control, you farmed it out, and not only like the lottery ticket, you know, if you're whatever you are, we do this all the time, that guy's Hispanic, and I'm Hispanic, and he's going to do something for me, because, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, is racist thinking, (laughs) number one. But a lot of black people in this country thought Barack Obama was going to do something Mm -hmm. for them, and they'd literally be going like, now I can... Yeah. It's it, and, but, and you know the weirdest one now is is like they go to these poor neighborhoods where they're stashing all the migrants now, and they're taking all the migrants and they're filling up the you know the school lock you know the the school gymnasiums and they're having all this these things that they were giving to the poor people and now they're giving them mm, to the migrants right? right and then all the poor people are staying around and they're pissed they're yeah, like of course. hey those free turkeys. That was my shit. Yeah. And that school and that system and that handout and that was all my stuff. And I'm like, listen, I feel your pain, but that's not your shit. Mm. Go figure out a way to buy a turkey next year and stop relying on whoever sent over the truck with the turkeys in it. Because no one ever taps them on the shoulder and goes, wait a minute. Why are you relying on Floyd Mayweather to give you a free turkey every Thanksgiving. Why can't you get a job, save your money, and buy a turkey? So this notion of, oh, I'm going to get this person elected and then things are going to change for me, um, does not work for anyone at the bottom. If you're at the top and you're a defense contractor or something, well, then, (laughs) yes, getting that person elected could. If you think you're going to get more turkeys for free next year, no, no, it is not. And it's the same as buying a lottery ticket. Yeah. Look, winners win regardless of who is sitting in the White House or sitting in Parliament or whatever. And there's nobody who was just doing terribly at life and out of shape and jobless and whatever. And suddenly the president changed and they became (laughs) a roaring success. It just it doesn't happen like that. That onus, that power is on you, which might be a little bit scary. But it's also massively empowering because it's like, hey, you've, you're the person who's got the chance to do it. 
you know, one of the, I really one of the most beneficial things of my upbringing is realizing early, very early, maybe age nine or ten or something, that my family wasn't going to do anything for me. Mm. And it seems like a pretty bitter pill to swallow when you know you're that young. But I did the math real fast, okay. and I was just like, these people have no history of doing anything for anybody. And they don't have any history of doing anything for me. So I got the mindset real fast that oh, I was going to have to do things mm. for me in order to have success. And the way it manifested itself is while everyone else was getting their headshots printed up and making resumes and trying to audition, I never auditioned for anything. I was like, no <laughs> one's going to take you. Nobody wants you. Yeah. Nobody's going to do it based on your headshot that you slide under their door. There will be no breaks. Mm. But you will, you will go out and you'll create breaks yes. for yourself because no politician and no family member. And by the way, for me, it was like, well, if the family doesn't do it, then why would the government do it? Why would the politician they do it? They don't even know your name. Why would the stranger do it? So I got off that notion super fast mm. and – and it, it paid dividends because I I ended up doing for myself, but I didn't hang out and, and and was disgruntled that others weren't helping. Yeah, and and that's important. And it goes beyond yourself as well because people take this attitude and they extend it to their families, they extend it to their children, they extend it to their communities. And when I say that, what I mean is this idea that it's up to politicians and bureaucrats to look after your children for you and to totally look after your community and to look after people just want to outsource everything. It's not just their own lives. It's also, Oh, you know, the government should be feeding my kids. The government should be taking care of this. The government should be, edu you know, educating, teach what, whatever the things are, even when it comes to health, there's people who are sitting there and they're fat and they're out of shape and they think it's because the government, the government's not doing enough for me. It's like, bro, you are the one who feeds yourself. You are the one who controls how much you exercise or don't. You're the one who controls how much water you drink. There is no politician who's going to come in there and get you in shape. Like that's, that's such an insane idea. But people are sitting around waiting for that in all these different aspects of life. Yeah. We unfortunately here exacerbate that by, you know, every time Joe Biden gives a speech <laughs> about extra baggage handling costs at, that the airlines are tacking up, and he goes, this disproportionately affects poor oh, people and black people <laughs> and brown people. I, I love that you have your own group. It's yeah. not even poor people. It's poor people and black yeah. people and, like, and brown people. And he, every message is this. You cannot do it for yourself. You need to elect us. We will then mm -hmm. get it done. It never gets done, but yet you somehow figure out a way to get reelected with yeah. no intentions of ever getting it done. And what's crazy is, you know, they go at these very, like these stupidly minor issues. I mean, I, I hadn't heard of that. Is, was oh, that, ba that baggage handling Now thing? you that, gotta find it. Byron or Dawson and uh, it, it, Biden with his fees. baggage fees. Yeah, the junk. Oh, it's that, just that's, a great, that's crazy. It's, it's, it, it, well, first off, that bitch mm. cost me 40 bucks uh, going through the airport <laughs> yesterday, but I'm, I'm rich, I, I can handle it. No, you're right, it's yeah. like, I have no idea. Like you're going, you know what? I want to outlaw one of the Gatorade flavors. Mm -hmm. Now who's with me? Exactly. It's like I don't know. We'd like you to focus on the border. So, perhaps. Yeah, how about how about how about the border? How about schools? How about actually cleaning up certain areas so that they are livable and they're not filled with crime and filth? You know, I'm with you on this one. I yeah. my mind goes numb yeah. at what percentage of people <laughs> he's talking to, but it's a great. It's a great clip yeah. because he's. We've now at the. If you're struggling financially, it's not because of the baggage fees, right? Decision. Some airlines, if you want six more inches between you and the seat in front, you pay more money, but you don't know it until you purchase your ticket. <laughs> I don't Look, like that folks, either. These but, are junk yeah. fees. They're unfair, and they hit marginalized Americans the hardest, especially low-income folks and people of color. All right, so marginalized. <laughs> So, Zuby, what would you be? Would you be marginalized? You're not low income. You would be people of color. If you're both, it cancels so out, you, actually. Yeah. I don't you, know. You, you're marginalized and a person of color. Uh, am I marginalized? I don't know. Well, are you a person of color? I, then you're marginalized. I don't like the term. Sorry, but you're like, marginalized. So okay. we don't have time <laughs> to talk to a marginal person on this podcast. Yeah, it, it affects 
the six inches, <laughs> you pay for it. You pay for it. I just, I flew back. I flew first class. I flew like mint out and I flew julep class back or whatever I flew. I, I got an, I paid extra to get some knee room. That was my choice. I knew about it. You didn't feel like you were oppressed? You didn't feel a bit of oppression there? I from the voluntary transaction facts. <laughs> black people and the marginal people. Uh, do you know, I, I can't stand the way liberal and progressive politicians always just throw in the, uh, you know, more, more pe the pe people, oh, marginalized people of color, or black and brown people or whatever. It's so condescendingly annoying well, not only when that, they just like, they, they, it's almost like a tick they have. But the <laughs> definition where he goes, poor people, and people yeah. of color. So uh -huh. he's talking about Jay-Z. <laughs> yeah, he qualifies. <laughs> he qualifies because yeah. he's hit with yeah. these things. That's the part that's truly insulting. And I will end with this, Zuby. I do talk to some black folk on occasion and I go, why aren't you more fucking insulted by this? Like, you should be insulted. Mm. You're being talked to this way. Especially when he bre breaks it up from poor people to black people. They're not capable, you know. He, yeah. he says, like, they're entrepreneurs. They just don't have access to lawyers and accountants. And it's like, Yo, I there, don't, why? There was a politician. Why aren't you assault, insulted? Um, in the UK, politicians don't play the race-based identity politics like they do over here. Uh, um, but there was one. There was one Labour politician. That's the the left-wing party in the UK, and uh, he he posted a tweet once saying something like, um, "Oh gosh, it was like uh, I w when I'm unless you know he said something uh, basically unless he's prime minister." then uh, black and brown people won't be able to achieve their full potential, something like right. that. He thought he, he, you know, he thought he'd killed it with this one. Right. <laughs> like, however, he, fr he got destroyed. Like, like yeah. the way people from every, white people were mad, black people were mad, bro. Every, every he, I, I think he ended up deleting the tweet. It was embarrassing. I was just like, I saw it, I was like, this is not going to go the way you planned, man. He, he thought he'd done something, but... Uh, I know. wish we had more of that here. <laughs> the Candy Calamity is the book. It's a children's book, and it's available uh, at candycalamity.com. And the podcast, Real Talk with Zuby as well. I'm going to be a guest on that show. Uh, website, zubymusic.com. Anything I'm leaving out, Zuby? Man, if you want to check out my music, it's on all platforms... Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, all that. Just search my name, Z-U-B-Y, and you can find me anywhere. And you can go to adamcarolla.com for my live dates and much more. Till next time, Adam Carolla for Zuby and Jonathan Kite and Chris Max Bata saying mahalo. Mahalo.